Hey guys, welcome to part 3 of what if Naruto became serious during Shunan exam. If you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 9. Tranquility. Jiraiya stood on Gamabunta in quiet anticipation. He had erected a sensory barrier around him and the toad boss should Manda to choose to go underground. Well, that and for something else. It's been a long time since this happened. Jiraiya remarked, the wind was howling fiercely as all three humans stood over their respective summon animals. Orochimaru, for this service you must offer me 100 sacrifices as tribute. Not only is that toad insulting me, he is making a mockery of my kin. That will not stand, do you hear me? Manda had practically demanded. Kabuto looked at Orochimaru who answered as best as he can. I will give you all the sacrifices that you wish after this battle, Manda. The snake huffed as his attention went back to the giant toad and the giant slug. You had better see to it. The snake boss said in closure. Not far from the. Pay close attention boss, while I erect the barrier. Try to take down Manda while I deal with what's next. Gamabunta merely huffed and grinned. With all the pleasure in the world, Jiraiya. Gamabunta charged. Giant knife drawn he reeled it back with both hands and thrusts the knife to the snake's face. Manda was quick to react, he leaned his head back by a little as the knife went past him and grabbed it with his mouth locking it tight from any attempt for the toad to yank it back at him. Behind the toad, a purple tail sprung up from the ground as it went towards the toad boss. With the barrier from Jiraiya fully functioning, Gamabunta was quick to dodge the sharpened tail that would have pierced his head and used his forearm to deflect the tail upwards as the toad used the force of the attack to spin around and intended to punch the hilt of his blade towards Manda's face. The snake boss quickly foresaw this and he decides to toss the gigantic blade up in the air and slithered away from his original position. Zeshi Nensen, Acid Slime. Katsuyu hurled a spray of acid towards the snake summons who ducked from the oncoming projectile as it went past him and onto a slab of rock that melted down to the ground. Manda lunged at Katsuyu fast and coiled her in a vicious grip that left her trapped within Manda's scales. The snake boss then turned his head towards Katsuyu and shouted with longing glee. It's time to eat. As he was about to take a bite out of the giant slug, Gamabunta jumps at the opportune moment and grabs his blade in midair and aims a strike towards Manda's head. Seeing this, Manda dodged the blade by a hair's breadth and grabs the blade with his mouth. The snake then twisted the blade sideways forcing Gamabunta to let go of the blade as Jiraiya ordered the toad boss. Duck. Boss. Jiraiya's barrier still in effect, Gamabunta did so and noticed his sword passing over his head quick enough as Katsuyu began dissembling and multiplying herself with little clones to get away from Manda as Tsunade jumped from the slug boss's head. The toad boss then leapt back to create more space between him and the snake summon as Katsuyu managed to free herself. Manda then proceeded to throw the blade back at Gamabunta Edge first who had once more dodged the blade in midair as it sailed past him quickly and landing behind him. By now, the seal on Tsunade's forehead glowed and twin lines coiled around her face and throughout her body as Tsunade landed on the ground while Katsuyu began reforming at her feet. It's time. Tsunade clenched her fists and slammed her right hand onto her left cracking her knuckles as well as her neck. Byakugo no Jutsu, Strength of a Hundred Technique. She could feel her chakra flaring so much after storing it on her seal for so long. Every muscle in her body were filled to the brim with her chakra strengthening them and powering her up even further. Noticing the spike on his female teammate's energy, Orochimaru was left momentarily distracted as did Manda, he never had a chance a voice from behind him shouted. Kaden. Gamayu Enden, fire release. Toad oil flame bullet. And a huge stream of fire washed over the snake summon and Orochimaru as he was engulfed in a stream of huge flames. W O O O S S S S H H H. Jiraiya remained cautious of this moment as he knew that Orochimaru was always a slippery bastard. He had not for once let his guard down as he separated his hands as they glowed with a dense amount of chakra. This ends here. Jiraiya thought to himself and clapped his hands together once more. When the flames cleared and noticed that the snake had shed his skin. All at once, three things had happened in a matter of three seconds. First, Manda pops up from the ground beneath Gamabunta intending to strike down the toad boss with a bite to his head, 
Then Tsunade appears above the snake and Orochimaru quickly notices Tsunade swinging the giant toad blade downwards the snake summons head seemingly having no time to dodge, Manda's snout was impaled downwards by the giant toad blade and pinned to the ground by the said blade as Jiraiya became surrounded in white smoke. As the smoke cleared, Jiraiya stepped forward, two new voices accompanying him. My, my, I never thought I'd see the day Jiraiya-chan would ask us for help again, especially now in his age. An old female voice had mused. Jiraiya's voice soon followed. I'm sorry An san but this fight is where we end my teammate's madness. Another voice had then said, that bad with Orochimaru, huh? I suppose things have to come full circle sooner or later. Though why'd you have to summon us when it's close to lunch time, Sunny? Sorry for the bad timing, Kashira but, Jiraiya then made his presence known, performing his famous kabuki pose. His pupils morphed sideways as the face paint he had stretched and covered all of his cheeks and reached to his forehead while his hands and feet were now growing warts. On his shoulders were two infant-sized toads. Both of them looked like they were pretty advanced in their ages. The Gama Senen has to perform one more time in this epic play. The gallant Jiraiya takes center stage. Shut up. Both Fukasaku and Shima punch the man's head on both sides as Jiraiya winced. Honestly Jiraiya, you should really learn to tone down on the theatrix. You're not a kid anymore. Shima chastised the man while Fukasaku shook his head. Your damn lungs are really pushing my ears, Jiraiya-chan. You should really reconsider your tone when you're with us. Orochimaru cursed, it was now that he was considering a tactical retreat. Both of his teammates were now in a higher state of being and if this continues on, it was he who would end up dead. So escape was what he did and he would have, if not for the fact that something had inexplicably struck him in the chest that would have stopped his heart then and there and quickly noticed that Tsunade had dug her fist to his thorax hearing a few of his ribs shatter upon impact. Tsunade had landed on Manda's snout and subsequently closed the gap between her and her teammate successfully landing a punch that would have destroyed enemy strongholds. The force of her punch made the air vibrate around them as Orochimaru not only skidded to the ground and forming a long trench of soil and rock, but a crater at the end of his landing that the ground around him caved in from Tsunade's strength. Not one to miss a beat, Jiraiya had performed a timely landing as Shima and Fukasaku went in sync with him. Senpo. Gomon, sage art. Bath of boiling oil. From Shima's mouth came the fire as Jiraiya supplied the oil while Fukasaku let out a wind jutsu fanning the flames as they filled the crater with oil hot enough to turn anything it touches to cinders. Orochimaru Sama. Kabuto shouted in panic as he was about to dash towards his master but stopped when Orochimaru had erupted from the ground just outside the crater as smoke wafted beneath him. He had managed to escape the burning oil just in time. They really are serious about killing me, Orochimaru said to himself and opened his mouth. From it came a single snake in his throat and from its throat, the sword of Kusanagi had emerged blade first and fired it towards Jiraiya. The sword of Kusanagi was said to be the legendary sword that could pierce anything. And anything that can survive its blade will ultimately be poisoned by the numerous deadly materials that coated the blade itself. It was a sword that could guarantee a kill. He had heard of Jiraiya mastering sage mode and as a measure to counter the toad sage's newfound durability, he had gained the sword. He had heard Serutobi once say to him that the Kusanagi was once in the possession of the pragmatic second Hokage, along with another famous sword, the Raijin. Jiraiya-chan, maximize your Kawazu Kumite and duck. Shima had shouted and Jiraiya complied, sensing the attack that was coming straight for the three of them. Jiraiya then jumped forward in a blink and appeared just before Orochimaru giving the snake user a vicious right hook that Orochimaru had blocked against. The sheer force of the attack and the weight beneath it strained Orochimaru's side as he flinched from the pain of having several of his ribs broken and piercing his lungs. He slid back by a little from Jiraiya's punch but his head still jerked to the left as he could have sworn he was actually hit there. It may not be as strong as Tsunade's but Orochimaru noted that it could nonetheless pierce any defense that he could set up physically. Orochimaru staggered back as the two frogs from Jiraiya's shoulders jumped and surrounded the snake Sanin on opposite ends and shouted. Senpo. Kawazu Naki, Sage Art. Toad Song. Orochimaru was then held paralyzed by the elder toads with a sonic wave that disturbed every sense in his body. He could feel being weighted down, nauseous, his world spinning, as his nose bled completely stunning him in one place. Sutankyaku, painful sky leg. Up above, 
Tsunade had appeared with right leg held up high and swinging it down with all of her might, super strength and all. Ha! Shima shouted and in quick succession, both toads retreated to Jiraiya as Tsunade delivered, on what Jiraiya could tell, be the most devastating kick in all the times they had been together. Smash! The earth crumbled beneath her feet, some turned to dust while others collapsed from the sheer power that Tsunade had shown. Beneath her was Orochimaru, collapsed and unmoving. Her foot stepping on the husk that was Orochimaru, she scowled. No, Orochimaru would never be this easy. Even if he was injured, he could still put up a fight. Don't fool yourself by thinking you could outsmart us, Orochimaru. And indeed, another Orochimaru did appear, but this time, he had shown himself in the form of thousands upon thousands of white snakes slowly reforming the man from feet to head. Tsunade could practically make out the ridged lines that were etched on the man's face in patterns that she could clearly deduce were scales. Kabuto had a moment of relief wash over him seeing Orochimaru alive and well he had never seen the man be pushed this much even with his battle with the third Hokage. I never thought that I would have to use the Shirohibitsukai no Jutsu, white snake charmer technique, against you two. You have crossed me far enough. Orochimaru's appearance changed once more and now he lunged at Tsunade and Jiraiya having turned into a giant white snake with multiple white snakes making up his body and scales. It was grotesque to say the least, to watch Orochimaru become something from his own experiments. Kaden. End in fire release, fire ball. Jiraiya let out a stream of flame from his mouth enhanced with the power of nature chakra and it grew to three times the size of what it was originally scorching the earth beneath the flames. But the white scales of Orochimaru's technique were certainly proving far from being flammable as he surged through the fire virtually unscathed. I can sense poison in his skin. Jiraiya-chan. Don't block, dodge. Fukasaku warned. And dodge he did, the disturbance of natural chakra aiding him, Jiraiya had performed an excellent maneuver against the white snake luring it towards him as he began performing another jutsu. Ranjushigami no jutsu, wild lion's main technique. Jiraiya's hair grew and became prehensile as it came to life and clashed with the white snake as it both attacked and evaded whatever each other was capable of throwing. Tsunade then leaned down on the ground with one hand touching the earth and the sheep hand seal held in front of her face. Doden. Gansaki no Yoroi, earth release, armor of stone. The ground beneath her rumbled as large stones rose and gathered around her and began to form plates around her arms, hands, chest, abdomen, legs and head. The stone armor finished off with a pair of horns protruding at the side of her head and charged at Orochimaru with her Shunshin no Jutsu, body flicker technique. Smash! With the strength of a hundred men, Tsunade bulldozed towards the white snake and rammed her rock-layered fist on Orochimaru's face that sent the snake crashing to the other side with multiple spikes from Jiraiya's hair managing to impale the white snake before it crashed just beside a shocked Kabuto who could only helplessly look from afar as his master was driven down to the ground once more. Tsunade and Jiraiya then stood side by side as the smoke cleared. Neither of them were looking too pleased with what just happened. The tale of the Densetsu no Sanin ends here. Tsunade had mentioned as the white snake reformed into a more familiar image of the man they once called a teammate. Try as they might to put the man down, the two of them knew of the unshaking feeling that nestled in their hearts that this was not over yet. Orochimaru had gotten up, feeling worse for wear. Even with his Hebetsukai no Jutsu, it was still a challenge to go up against the fellow students of the aptly named, Professor. After all, they were the greatest legends Konoha has ever produced in their time, coinciding with the legendary White Fang. This was a testament to each and every single one of their achievements over time. Their names were revered and feared throughout the land through exploits of almost mythical status. Orochimaru had no doubt that if the fight were to ever continue then it would most likely result in his death and not the other way around. Harsh as it was, he knew he had to cut his losses once more then and there. Inside, he had cursed his teacher again. Even from beyond the grave, Serutobi had thrown a wrench at his plans. Jiraiya had cursed inwardly at the man's resiliency. No matter how much they throw everything at Orochimaru, the man simply wouldn't be put down. Tsunade growled when she noticed that a part of Orochimaru's face was now torn off revealing another skin underneath. Instead of the light gray ashen color of his, it was creamy white skin. Something that brought alarm bells ringing inside the heads of both Jiraiya and Tsunade. So you finally finished that jutsu. I always knew you were a sick and depraved psycho. Tsunade mentioned and Jiraiya scowled. 
So this is one of the reasons why Serutobi Sensei failed to take you down. I should let you know, Orochimaru. Now that I am aware of this, I really do have to kill you now. Jiraiya was no fool. Age and experience had taught him well enough to recognize a threat bigger than what it has been since the invasion. It's a sentiment that will not come to pass, Jiraiya. This jutsu has given me a new life and I intend to fully abuse this system for years to come. Although I may have my arms sealed now, I have other ways to regain my abilities back. The ground beneath the snake user began sucking Orochimaru in and with parting, he sent a grim and ominous message to Jiraiya and Tsunade. I concede my defeat now, but I will come back. Do know this, the next time that we gather, it will be the village that will be torn asunder. It is only a matter of time. With that, Orochimaru's whole figure was swallowed within the earth with Kabuto following suit and vanished in a cloud of smoke. Within Naruto. Naruto had once again awoken in the darkest pits of the tunnels in his mind. In front of him lay the largest gate he had ever seen. It looked as majestic and as ominous as ever from what he could tell. Getting up, he winced as he held his chest in pain. He slowly got up and muttered to himself. Here again. It was foolish of you to think that you could take a human older than you without my chakra, brat. The nine-tailed fox had cut in. His thoughts were cut off when the face of the tailed beast showed its head behind the golden cage. Karama, I had no time to think about using your chakra. Besides, it worked didn't it? The fox gave a huff. And look at where has that taken you. The hairless ape had torn your heart to shreds. You were lucky to still be breathing, extremely and unbearably lucky, brat. Naruto simply waved it off, maybe. Then the boy grinned and turned his head back at the beast, why would you care, though? You turning to a big softy. The fox merely snorted at the boy, do not think highly of yourself, brat. But the next time your reckless behavior shows itself, I would personally make sure to get out of this prison and eat you before you die. Now you're just sounding like you want to keep me alive. It sounds like you're not such a grouch after all, Karama. Karama gave a pompous snort at the puny brat before him. Don't misunderstand me, brat. What I don't wish is to be stuck here longer than it is necessary. But if you do not use my power more, then all the more reason that I can escape from here. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this. You're seriously offering me a chance at power all the while saying that if I don't, you'll eventually see a crack in the seal. The Kayubi gave a sinister smile and all the answers were given to him wordlessly. Naruto gave an equally sinister grin at him to match the fox and gave his reply. You have something planned, don't you? Don't try to take me for an idiot, Kurama. I'm willing to use your chakra, but I'll always use it as a last resort. Kurama raised an eyebrow at this. He was genuinely curious as to what this boy was thinking. I don't know what's in that head of yours and frankly, I don't care. We're stuck together like this and even if it means I have to take your insults, your sneers and general grouchiness in stride, I would have to. Sometimes it takes a few things happening that we would end up working with people we can't even stand. I know that from experience. Naruto's fierce grin was turned into a simple one as he remembered the times that he had squabbled with his teammate, Sasuke and how they had been able to work together even though they had a very turbulent relationship. He thought, perhaps Kurama was the same. Thousands of years of knowledge about your species and countless power plays have made me grown jaded of your kind, brat. What makes you think a little talk is all that you need to change me? Naruto's grin remained, the fox may be a proud and hateful thing, but he knew something that he thought he could relate to. How the hatred in him quelled and how he was saved from his own despair. He thought of a lot of things, things that mattered to him and none mattered more when Aruka had said to him in the wisest and gentlest voice he had ever heard in his entire life when he was younger and it was those very words that saved him all those years ago. In essence, he felt like he was passing on something important for anyone who wanted to ask those same questions. Sometimes, we all just need a friend to talk to. Naruto said with a smile as he sat down in front of the huge gate and leaned down. Kurama was silenced with the boy's words and then Naruto continued. I didn't know my parents. I was always alone, I had no one growing up or at least that's what I thought. I didn't know better, I had you ever since I was born. I can't escape that fact. But you're lucky Kurama, you know who gave you your name, you know your parent. In some part me, at the very least, I'm jealous of you. Kurama's eyes grew wide as the silence from him continued. The fox simply gave a huff at that and then replied, 
you are one naive child, brat. Of that I am sure. If you must know who my old man is and since I have nothing better else to do, then let me tell you the tale of Rakuto Senen. Rakuto Senen. Yes boy, the one and only. The origin of ninjutsu. My, father, the one who gave your kind the knowledge of chakra, I will tell what he was like and his exploits during his time here on this mortal plane. Kurama didn't know why he was beginning to tell the tales of the man he had come to call as a father, but he knew was that this boy listened to him and believed him. That was something he had never encountered in all the years he has been imprisoned or even when he was free. This was completely new to him, to say the least. In the boy's mindscape, time was not a factor. Kurama could tell that time wasn't something he had known since being imprisoned, he had no grasp of it here and even if he did, it meant so little to him. He had been in this world for far too long and frankly, seconds to him were hours or even days to all finite beings. The concept of time never really clicked to him in manner of speaking. But once he told the tale of Hagoromo Otsutsuki, the sage of six paths and the Shinju, he simply couldn't stop as he told in pride the exploits of his father. And this simpleton, this boy who had no problems risking life and limb in battle, listened and clung to his words and stories. Not only that, he also told about the sons of the sage, Ashura and Indra, the sons who would later establish the two clans of ages past, the Senju and the Uchiha. The boy scowled at the mention of the name of Sasuke's dead clan. It was something that royally pissed him off because he had realized that Sasuke came from such a strong and noble heritage that went beyond expectations. Man, seriously, fuck the guy. Wasn't having the Sharingan enough, Sasuke. Now you have to be the descendant of the one who created ninjutsu. Give me a fucking break here. What? You're upset that your teammate is a descendant of my old man. Kayubi said with a sneer. Naruto merely ruffled his hair in frustration and closed his ears in complete defiance. Ah, I'm not hearing this. I definitely didn't hear anything about the bastard being a descendant of the old sage. Inwardly, Kurama gave an amused chuckle. The brat got overexcited in the littlest of things. What a complete idiot his host was. Sometimes he wondered how this idiot managed to survive his life even with his powers in tow. It was a little later when Naruto was about to stand and ask something to the fox when he suddenly vanished from his own mindscape. Kurama looked down, and noticed nothing more than a ripple on the waters of the boy's mind. He smirked. You're the strangest as strange as they come, brat. Do you see this, old man? Is he what you see in your dreams? Is this tranquility? Naruto suddenly opened his eyes and found himself comfortably placed in bed. He got up, a few bandages on his shoulders and chest in surprise as he sat up. His frown turned into utter horror and shock then to complete anger when he found Jiraiya and Tsunade rummaging to his suitcase full of money. Ah, you two jackasses. That's my money over there. Don't touch it. Jiraiya and Tsunade looked at the blonde in surprise then to each other and immediately stood upright and laughed nervously. Ah, Naruto, my favorite apprentice. So glad that you could be awake so early. Tsunade had mentioned that you would possibly be out cold for another two days. I'm so glad you're awake. We were just checking your stuff if you had anything useful that could help you. Jiraiya shouted mirthfully, hoping to diffuse any annoyance and anger from the boy only to be given the middle finger from the blonde. The hell do you mean checking through me stuff? You're robbing me blind here, Arrow Senen. What was that about the three shinobi vices? Money, women and alcohol. Fuck you both. Naruto angrily replied. L listen here brat, some debt collectors just managed to track me down a little earlier and they said that I have to pay up. So as compensation for me saving your life, at least let me have some of your cash so I can pay off my debt, Tsunade said with a smile as she rubbed her hands together looking like a sleazy businesswoman, forced creepy smile and all. Naruto looked at the woman skeptically and replied in a deadpan voice, right, the casinos are just at the ground floor, the ones that are going to collect your money are the slot machines, real smooth, granny. A tick mark appeared on Tsunade's forehead. The hell did you just say, Gaki? I ought to smack you from here all the way back to Konoha you snot-nosed brat. Just outside the room, Shizune casually opened the door and then the big glass door that led to the balcony. Granny, granny, granny. How about I give you some prunes for your D-E-N-C-H-E-R-S? Wait, no, don't touch my money, goddamn it. No, I have to hit the cabaret with some of that. Share some of it Tsunade. Smack. 
Jiraiya crashed through the wall beside the door in Naruto's room and then breaking the window glass that was on the other side. Damn you T-S-U-N-A-D-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-E-
Sasuke thought and began sidestepping cautiously while Sakura twirled her wooden stick with her wrist as she leaned forward while sidestepping also. Both of them encircled each other, waiting for each other to perform an attack. This was a counter-to-counter -counter battle, wherein the first to attack isn't always the guaranteed one to have an advantage. This was more as a test to their minds as it was to their reflexes. It was as if they were two snakes eyeing each other before a strike. Sakura slightly lowered her stick and cautiously and in quick succession, tapped it with enough force to throw Sasuke's stance off and lunged at him. Quick to re-establish his guard, Sasuke used the motion of his sword as he took a step back and went for a thrusting maneuver straight to Sakura's nose. Sakura was quick to act, once more twirling her wooden sword sideways and deflecting Sasuke's thrust around and made a move towards his hand with her open left hand. Sasuke relented and retreated his hand side-stepped with his rear foot spinning. Now with their backs against each other, Sasuke was the first to turn around and strike Sakura down with a downward slash. Sakura turned and deflected the strike with her sword by slanting her blade slightly to her left as Sasuke's strike lost momentum and entered in perfect range of her checking hand. Sasuke had soon realized that she had entered past his dangerous range as she gripped Sasuke's right hand and proceeded to strike it with the hilt of her sword but not before Sasuke tossed the sword at face level and gripped the handle between his teeth and swinging it at Sakura's face, taking a page out of Naruto's book. Sakura had no time to react accordingly as the sword was within centimeters to her face before Sasuke had stopped. That was a very good display, both of you. Kakashi praised his students as they both wordlessly stopped and lowered their guard. You two are still quite far from mastery but your practical uses of the stances are quite remarkable. Especially, you Sakura. You knew that Sasuke was baiting you with the Geden no Kame so you resorted to throw him out of it before making a strike. The only thing that you forgot was Sasuke's speed which we will need to work on. Both of you showed good improvisation with learning the basics. Kakashi said with a smile beneath his mask and then heard the sound of a familiar voice. Kakashi Sensei, Sakura, Sasuke, shouted from the distance, a blonde had run towards them with a grin on his face as he was still wearing his backpack. Kakashi turned around and saw Naruto waving at them with a grin. Well, will you look at that? Finally back from your mission, huh? Naruto answered with a nod, yeah, I just did. Hope you guys were doing something while I was gone. Kakashi looked to his students who had sheathed their practice weapons back and walked towards the blonde. Naruto. What happened? What was your mission anyway? Sakura asked while Naruto scratched the back of his head with a sheepish grin. Well, I got sent out with a mission from the elders to help out retrieve the supposed god I'm Hokage. I was asked to keep the man who knew the candidate in line and keep him from being distracted, nothing too big. Naruto mentioned. Jiraiya had told him that he shouldn't talk about the events as to why he was chosen on the mission and he had to lie a little and make it seem that it was nothing to worry about. The full mission details would have to be disclosed to Kakashi once he was called to the tower. Sakura had raised an eyebrow at this, so you know who's going to be Hokage, now. Naruto grinned, yeah pretty, much. Though much of the stuff wasn't that eventful, and I even got a boatload of money as a result. Naruto showed off his suitcase and opened it revealing stacks of money that you wouldn't normally get on a mission. W whoa, that's a lot. How'd you get this much, anyway? There's no way that you could have gotten this from a mission. Sakura said in surprise, Kakashi did as well leaning down on the wads of cash that was currently in Naruto's possession. Naruto looked a little sheepish at this and gave a nervous reply. W well, I sorta, maybe got distracted by the casinos too, Naruto replied. Sasuke scoffed at this, typical Dobi getting distracted. And you're the one who was supposed to keep the contact in line. Naruto grew a tick mark, shut it, bastard. I got tricked by Aero Senen to do play poker. Don't you dare blame it on me. Sasuke and Sakura looked at each other and asked Naruto, Aero Senen. Yeah, his name is Jiraiya, said I had to do it in order to get some info on Bachan, Tsunade by the way, to track her down. Won a lot of money from it and in my defense, he hooked me into it, I swear. Trust Naruto to call two of the legendary Sanin with derogatory nicknames, Sakura supposed. Cha, I don't care how you got your money but you are treating all of us in a nice place to eat right now, you hear me, Naruto. Naruto shrugged, I was already planning on it. But let's all do it later tonight, I've got places to go and things to do and all. Wait, 
You're not going to train with us? Sakura asked. Sasuke seemed to raise an eyebrow to this as well. Well, I sort of can't. I'll come by tomorrow if you have some training, though. You can count on that. For now, I have a lot of things to do. I'll meet you all at Yakiniku Q. Naruto closed his suitcase and waved at the three of them as he left. Sasuke looked at his teacher who waved as well and said, You know Naruto is acting strange, right? Kakashi shrugged. I suppose, he would never miss the opportunity to train, but then again, he must be tired from his mission. Two weeks out of the village can really tire a ninja out. Remember Wave Country? Ah, of course, Sasuke remembered. Their first C-rank mission that ended in disaster, but he would still find it rather strange to pass out on training for something else. Not that he minded though, if Naruto wishes to lag behind then he'll simply grow stronger than his teammate faster. Should we get back to practice, sensei? Sakura asked and Kakashi simply smiled. No, I don't think we have much more to practice on your styles for now. Besides, I have a feeling we'd be having a meeting later tonight. So it's just you three who's going to celebrate. Sasuke-kun. Sakura turned to her crush who scoffed at it. I'm not going. Why not? It's a nice setting. Plus Naruto's paying. She reasoned. Kakashi patted the boy on his shoulder. Now, now, I'm sure this would be a good thing. Training every time will wear your body down, Sasuke. I propose you go along with your teammates for now. Think of it as a team building exercise. Besides, even members of the Anbu tend to let loose once in a while. And it was no joke. It was no secret that Anbu members tend to let loose once in a while but they tend to be more, uninhibited when letting out steam. He remembered how a female Anbu member once had tried to have her way with his significant other in a very vocal manner inside the headquarters and most of them didn't mind it at all if ever. And when it came to drinking, Kakashi shook those thoughts away. He wasn't going to mention those particular vices to Sasuke anytime soon. Give or take a few years, and Sakura would have his hide if ever Sasuke ever got into a messy vice that many of his fellow Junin and Anbu members much like himself. They should enjoy their youth once in a while too, Kakashi thought with a smile as Sasuke somewhat relented with a sigh. If it would get Sasuke to open up more, then Kakashi was all for it. Hmm, maybe we should invite a few others too while we're at it. Sakura asked, thinking about Ino's team and Kiba's team to invite. Just don't start clinging to me or have a fight with Ino. It gets annoying. Sakura scoffed, the same could be said between you and Naruto, Sasuke-kun. Kakashi chuckled at that and sent his goodbyes to the both of them before vanishing in a cloud of smoke. With Naruto. Naruto didn't know what his purpose was in visiting this prisoner after settling his equipment down at his apartment. All that he knew was that he had wanted to talk to him after everything that happened. Many of the guards were wary and some of the Anbu were watching him from afar, no doubt on high alert in this part of the establishment. He had known that they were not taking chances with a Jinchuriki as unstable as Gara. When the door had opened, he was greeted with a girl taller than him whose sandy blonde hair was tied in four pigtails. You're that kid that beat Gara back in the invasion. What are you doing here? Naruto merely replied, I just, wanted to talk to Gara. Tamari had raised her eyebrow at this but nonetheless welcomed him inside. Ever since the invasion, Jiraiya of the Sanin had adjusted the seal on Gara's shoulder that would help contain the demon. For four days, Gara was asleep, as peaceful as he had ever been ever since. She didn't know the purpose as to why an opposing village would help them out, but it might be more as a precautionary measure before Gara could snap. Once Naruto sat down on a table, he had waited for Gara to meet him there. I received from Tamari that you wanted to talk to me, Uzumaki Naruto. The boy asked, the boy's tone was as flat as ever, but compared to back then it wasn't laced with the insanity and bloodlust that he was known for. Yeah, was all Naruto's reply as Gara sat in front of him, the table separating them. I just wanted to know how you are doing. Naruto asked, he gave a wry grin and scratched the back of his head. He didn't really have anything in mind. I am curious. Why go to such a thing, Uzumaki Naruto? Gara asked. The boy in front of Gara shrugged and gave a nervous laugh. Well, it's just that you and I are alike by a lot of things. I guess I feel that I need to get to know you more. I just can't shake whatever it is that is making me angry at the same time sad of what happened to you. Naruto then had one hand holding his blonde hair as he leaned his elbow on the table. 
There are times when even I could have fallen so hard that I would have just about given up and start becoming what they see me as. Naruto's expression turned dark as he stared upwards. Sometimes, I wonder, if it would be worth it if I had just become like you, Gara. I had those thoughts too. Gruesome to think about, huh? The boy asked rhetorically and Gara nodded silently, he knew perfectly well what Naruto was talking about. Gara, I just want to say, Naruto trailed off before he stood up and walked towards the red head, extending a hand to him with a smile. If you don't find Suna as a home, maybe you could stay here. Maybe you can be part of this village. It's not better than yours by a long shot but, I'm willing to be your friend. Gara's eyes widened at the simple gesture that Naruto had given him. No one had ever said to him even when he was a child. This was something he had never expected. I tried to kill you, Uzumaki. Cut the full name out. Just call me Naruto, Gara. Naruto had cut off his hand was still extending to him for a handshake. Besides, none of that matters now. What happened can't be taken back. All we can do is to keep moving forward. So, I would, I would like to be your friend. Gara stood from his chair in wonder as he felt a tear fall from his left eye. What is this? Why are there tears? Naruto simply grinned and said, because you're happy, Gara. When we cry, Sometimes it's not just sadness that fills us. But seriously, stop crying, you're probably freaking your siblings out. He looked back behind the door that led to the living room as Kenkiro and Tamari flinched. So, what do you say? Gara wordlessly gave a nod and shook Naruto's hand. I would be honored to be considered your friend, Naruto. Naruto grinned and shook Gara's arm vigorously behind the door, Kankuro and Tamari were smiling silently. The elder sister raised a single finger up to her brother gesturing to be quiet as they left the door and went back to their rooms. But, I cannot stay here. I am also Suna's greatest asset as you should know. I am a Jinchuriki as much as you are. My heart says that I stay, but my mind says that I cannot. Naruto didn't understand the reasoning behind Gara's words, but he came to respect it just as much as he had respected Hinata's wishes. For now, Naruto had to accept the words of his newfound friend. It took a few more minutes before Naruto had overstayed his welcome and decided to leave things at that end for Naruto to leave and as he was leaving, he turned back towards the siblings and said, I know that it's not possible to ask for you to come, but I'll invite you anyway, I want you guys to come to the barbecue place, my treat. Maybe next time, though. The three siblings merely gave him a smile and waved their goodbyes as Konkuro said, he may be an idiot, but I guess he's better than most idiots. Sometimes, I think that the kid has a few screws loose in his head, but then I remember he's already befriended my brother. Tamari remarked. Strength comes to those who has had a harsh life but refuse to bend to its will and to those who create ideas that bridge people together comes wisdom. Uzumaki Naruto is, a good person whose strength is greater than mine. Gara remarked as he went inside, Tamari and Konkuro noticed their youngest brother having a smile on his face, as if for the first time in his life since Yashimaru, Gara had reached a form of tranquility that they never saw. Hokage Tower. The people inside the building were running frantically left and right, with the arrival of Tsunade, the office had become much more lively than usual. The elders along with two of the Sanin were walking to the office as they watched countless staff members began carrying stacks of paperwork to be given to the different departments. Homura was speaking well enough that the three of them could hear each other amidst the chaos of the building. On the first of your agenda is your inauguration, Tsunade. The people of Konoha are expecting their Hokage in a few days and your staff has graciously arranged everything well enough. There will be a meeting with the daimyo soon after as. Tsunade had then cut the older man off as she spoke, if all the preparations there are complete, then there's no problem, what I want to see are the papers concerning the bolstering of our forces. I have heard from Jiraiya that it is our priority as of now and I am to see the list of Chunin candidates that were given good remarks during the final exam. I also want to see if any of our ninja in inactive duty for the past three months in order to see if I can do anything to place them in active status. Homura was silent and looked at his fellow elder, Kohaku who could only nod. Very well, we will send Azumo and Kotetsu to gather the papers that you need to look into. I'll have one of them retrieve some of the medical records that you require from the hospital. Tsunade shook her head, there's no need. I have sent my personal assistant, Shizun to complete such tasks. Right now, 
I wish to rest and want those papers in by morning and send the passers to me two hours later. The Junin are meeting tonight, is that correct? The two elders nodded. Good, then it makes things easier. Jiraiya, is your spy network ready to give updates? Her teammate replied, it won't be for another two weeks. Tsunade nodded. Good, I want to see it on my desk as soon as it is available. Homura looked at Jiraiya approvingly with a nod and said to the man, you have chosen well, Jiraiya. The meeting with the Junin later would soon prove an interesting watch, to say the least. Later that evening, Naruto had been waiting patiently at Yakiniku Q for everyone to arrive. He was wearing his orange shirt with black long sleeves and black pants as he waited for his teammates. He had a feeling that Sakura would blabber on to Ino that about his excursions for the past two weeks and would ultimately invite his former classmates and possibly Lee's team over to celebrate. Naruto didn't mind though, the more the merrier, he supposed. Naruto Nichin, a child's voice called out to him. The blonde turned around and saw Konohamaru looking at him with surprise. I haven't seen you since the funeral. Where've you been? He asked, curious to his idol's whereabouts for the past two weeks. Well, I had an important mission to locate the new Hokage. He said with a grin, Konohamaru frowned when he heard the news of the new Hokage. The expression on his face was telling to the blonde who raised an eyebrow. What's the matter, Konohamaru? You look like you're upset. The blonde said as he sat down by one of the wooden benches just near the stand. Come here, sit down. Let's talk about it. He invited the boy, but Konohamaru somehow shook his head. And no, Nichin, I don't want to talk about it. I doubt you could help me through it. He said. Naruto simply sighed and stood up before bopping Konohamaru on the head earning a yelp from the boy. You idiot. When someone says, I don't want to talk about it. It's obvious he has to, ya hear me. I it's just that, I don't think I can ever let go of grandpa's death ever since that day. Naruto then told Konohamaru to sit down while grabbed something to a nearby convenience store. When he came out, he had a twin popsicle in his hands and shared it to Konohamaru. So it's that, huh? Naruto asked and Konohamaru nodded. A silence sat in between the two children as Naruto broke the popsicle in half and gave the other half to Konohamaru. Death is an eventual thing, there's no escaping it. It's simply the natural course of things. I remember those words from Kakashi Sensei during our mission in Wave. The old man's death, it hit me hard too, you know. He was like my grandpa too. Most of all, he taught me how to read and write in his spare time when I was younger and gave me the idea to become Hokage. If it wasn't for him, I probably won't even be ninja at all. Konohamaru looked at Naruto who was eating his ice cream as he was leaning forward with a melancholic smile. Sasuke said that the pain of loss never truly goes away, and you know what? He's right there, hey, that bastard sometimes could give you some of the most worldly advice. I could never truly get over the old man's death. There's not a single night that I haven't thought about it. It hurts but at the same time, what can I do? I can't wallow about it all day, somehow we have to move on with our lives. I'm sure he wouldn't have wanted me to be sad all the time. Besides, Naruto turned to Konohamaru with a smile while having the ice cream in his mouth before speaking to Konohamaru, the old man would have told you to get on with your life too, and find something worthwhile. Become stronger or whatever, you can't stay like that forever. Konohamaru looked down and ate his popsicle too as Naruto grinned. Besides, if you keep being depressed and not train, I'll beat you and become Hokage faster than you do said the boy pointing to Konohamaru's cheek and pressing it with a teasing grin. Konohamaru frowned. As if, I won't ever be beaten by the likes of you, Naruto Nichin. Konohamaru shouted, swathing the blonde boy's hand away and stood up. Atta boy, Konohamaru, Naruto said with a grin as he put his hand on Konohamaru's head. If you want to beat me, then become stronger, stronger than you could possibly ever be and when the time comes that we become candidates to be Hokage you're going to have to face me at my strongest, you got that. Konohamaru simply gave a nod at this and grinned as he made a run for it behind the blonde but not before turning back and say, just you wait, Naruto Nichin, I'll be strong enough to beat you senseless. Don't do anything stupid, Konohamaru. I'm warning you, Naruto replied with a grin as he gave a wave to the honorable grandson. Naruto. The blonde turned back to see Shikamaru. Ino and Choji behind him while Sakura and Sasuke were not far behind. 
Hey guys, took you long enough. Naruto said with a grin as he raised his hand to greet them. Ino was being a pain. She and Sakura had been fighting all the way here. Shikamaru pointed his thumb haphazardly to where Ino and Sakura were who argued with Sasuke in the middle. A sweat drop appeared behind his head at this. They've been at it since we left the flower shop. Choji helpfully added and Naruto sighed. All right break it up. You two or else I'm not paying over here. That or Sasuke is leaving, whichever happens. Naruto shouted as both Ino and Sakura kept staring at each other while grinding their teeth. Sasuke, who was in the middle, looked completely disinterested and had an expression that clearly said he didn't want to be anywhere with the two girls. Yo, Naruto, I heard you got a busy in a casino a few days ago and won. Seriously, that is some strange and ridiculous luck you have there. Kiba shouted followed behind by Shino and Hinata who was smiling at the blonde who in turn smiled back. Behind them were Neji, Tenten and Lee who was walking with a crutch. I was almost forgotten back there. Shino muttered as he felt upset that he was about to be left behind until Kiba reminded them. Sup. Naruto wanted to continue his greeting but forgot the kid with the sunglasses. Shino. Naruto-san. My name is Shino. I'm hazarding a guess that you forgot too. Shino replied feeling more upset with each passing second while Naruto gave a nervous laugh. All right. I haven't really forgotten, Shino. You only say that because I reminded you of my name. Shino replied as a matter of factly while Kiba patted his teammate on the back. Ah get over it Shino, I told you to dress less inconspicuously next time for these guys to remember you, but no, you don't even listen to me. Kiba remarked. W welcome back, Naruto-kun. Hanada opened while the blonde replied with a wave, glad to be back, Hanada. I'm just glad my mission is over. Yash. Naruto-kun. I thank you for this most youthful feast that you have sponsored for us. Naruto grinned at Lee and said, perfect timing, guys, I was just about to talk to you guys about Lee's condition. Neji, Tenten and Lee looked at each other before looking back at Naruto. What exactly are you talking about, Naruto? Tenten asked while Neji gave a nod. Come on, let's go inside. You'll want to hear what I have to say. Naruto grinned at them as they went inside. Naruto had entered inside followed closely by his peers, some he considers his friends. The squabbles, the talks, even the insults hurled at each other. He knew it was for fun, and those things he had unquestionably cherished for years to come. It felt like a part of him had grown as he stepped into the shoes of an adult as a newly appointed chunin of Konoha. Shikamaru noticed the people around him and he too gave a smile. Everyone was having a lively good time. He had wished for things to remain as they are and cursed himself that he knew better. But for the sake of his comrades, he will not allow each one of them to perish that he swore. Tonight would be the first night of many that they would gather, but it would be a long time before they could meet up again completely in the next. Hokage Tower. Shikaku was finally relieved that the Hokage had finally arrived in their presence as they all lined up and faced the one currently standing at the podium. He had to admit, Tsunade's arrival had come in a timely manner and he was glad it was officially over for him in running Konoha's forces and maintaining the logistics in the village's restoration. His thoughts were finally cut off when Tsunade began to talk. It's good that all of you are here tonight because we have many things to discuss and talk about in the coming months. All of you Junin better prepare yourselves for right now, I will enact changes that will be for the benefit of this village and introduce new ideas for our forces. I don't expect that some of you will agree with what I have in mind, but I expect you to follow my orders on my command. Do I make myself clear on this matter? Hi. Many of the Junin replied, Tsunade gave a nod as she looked at Jiraiya. Jiraiya, debrief them on the current situation about Orochimaru and Akatsuki, leave no detail out. After that, we will be discussing the construction of a group in dealing with these threats. Shikaku. Tsunade called for her best strategist up front and the man stepped forward. We are going to review all our battle strategies, our tactics and our logistics. It's time we take the fight to our enemies. Shikaku inwardly groaned, at least his role in this matter would be less demanding compared to the former. He just hoped whatever happens in the future, his child and his child's friends would make it through it in one piece. Chapter 10. Waves from a Ripple. Kurama Yakumo had always had a fascinated look on to a boy who would jog very early in the morning outside their house. She would look by at the window and would see a fiercely focused boy, who
who wore the silliest of spandex, the dorkiest of haircuts and the thickest set of eyebrows she had seen since ever. She had heard several times that he was a shinobi who graduated with not even a sliver of chakra that he could expel and use for techniques and her interest grew even further. For being a child who could not even do the simplest of ninjutsu and the weakest of constitutions, Yukumo felt like she was watching a handicapped person will himself into such a rigorous profession that she could not help but feel admiration to this boy. His actions had lit a fire in her heart, a desire to overcome her weakness and live the same way as this boy had. He had shown her how powerful one's mind can be once it has been set. And if anything, her mental fortitude was something she had to take pride on. Then, one day, he stopped. A peculiar phenomenon, she thought. The boy's routine was literally every single day or at least every other day. And he would do it again the next day without as much as a sliver of whining. A strange thing, she thought. Certainly he couldn't have been killed on a mission, he was a genin from what she could tell. But she had known about the invasion and she was worried, everybody in Konoha knew about the invasion. Then she shook her head, it happened over a month before the invasion so it wasn't possible. She had heard that there are times people die during the Chunin exams which occurred a month before that. But for five days, the boy hadn't returned. Yukumo was worried and for the first time in her life, she was going to disobey her uncle as curiosity grew a second head within her. What happened to you, Lee San? Naruto had been blessed by the goddess of fortune. Kakashi knew it, for a long time. During the several months long tenure of his only team, by far the luckiest of the three was Naruto. The boy just had mountains and mountains of good fortune set before him. Perhaps this was a transgression due to his past and maybe present. Kakashi didn't know but the fact that the boy had been on a lucky streak ever since the finals of the Chunin exams, the boy's recent promotions and the money he has won in a casino, and maybe, Kakashi thought, that the good fortune smiling upon Naruto was indeed good karma for what he has done or what he has endured throughout childhood. That would certainly be the case, Tsunade didn't seem so enthused about going back to the village that had held too many painful memories but Naruto was able to do that. That was a feat worthy of legend, if he did say so. According to Jiraiya's account on the mission, Naruto not only almost neutralized Kabuto, he had convinced Tsunade to take the mantle. Such an accomplishment was understated with mere words. He had wished he could have seen what Naruto had done. Uruka stood beside the desk with a smile on his face, proud of what Naruto was able to accomplish what he couldn't back then at the academy, finish earlier than anyone. So now, Kakashi was standing with his student beside him. To his right was Asuma who was smirking at his own pride and joy while Shikamaru was scratching his head in bewilderment. How the hell did I make Chunin, anyway? He asked. Naruto merely gave a nervous laugh as Tsunade grabbed a few papers neatly covered by two folders as she reviewed the scores for the two genin. The first exam involved information gathering and taking calculated risks. And although one of you failed into gathering information, she glares amusedly at Naruto who merely shrugged within. A what can you do? Gesture who passed due to Ibiki's technicality. Shikamaru unsurprisingly passed that one while Naruto passed with flying colors by taking a calculated risk. She surmised as she turned the page, foregoing the second part of the exam due to it being more of an elimination stage as well as the preliminary battles. We didn't have to base a lot of grades in the second exam since the main requirement was to fulfill the objective and make it to home base as a team with a time limit, so that's easy enough. Your performances, however, were graded heavily on the third part of the exam. Tsunade then coughed a little as she began her report with a grin. It says here that you lost due to overuse of your cage main no jutsu but you masterfully created setup after setup to pin down your opponent with just one jutsu. I can see you are a good strategist taking after your father, so why the hell shouldn't you be promoted? Your team leader material, kid. Tsunade then turned to Naruto. As for you, brat, it says here that you have a knack for tricks and masterful use of the cage bunshin, you set up zones quickly to disable any first line option that your opponent may have making one on one taijutsu useless against you. Not only that, you can change strategies at the fly for adapting to different situations, create distractions, baits and setups for openings and split second sound decision making. You're a multi-purpose, multi-tasking, battlefield controller. It says here you're recommended for Chunin status immediately. And since I've reviewed the tape, I don't see why not. Like Shikamaru, you're a team leader in the making. I think you two deserve this promotion above anyone else. 
Shikamaru looked at Naruto incredulously while Naruto grinned with his hands on the back of his head. Well, it's no big deal for someone like me. Naruto replied with a boast while Shikamaru and Tsunade rolled their eyes at that. Whatever the case, since you're newly minted Chunin, Aruka here is going to present you your vests. Tsunade then pointed her thumb at Aruka who had two green flak vests at the ready. Naruto immediately grabbed his and fitted himself with it. The material felt snug on his torso and grinned at Kakashi who merely looked surprised. He resembles Sensei quite well. Shikamaru followed suit and lazily put his on as well. And I thought all my troubles are going to go smoother from this point on, Shikamaru mumbled thinking about how he should have given up even before entering the exams. Tsunade then, to make it official, grabbed her stamp and pressed it on both Shikamaru's and Naruto's papers. From this moment on, you are now official Chunin of Kanahagakur no Sato, wear your uniforms with pride. Tsunade said with a grin at the two as she stood up. Now excuse me, I have a couple of appointments that I need to check in the hospital. As soon as I leave, you four better get your asses out of my office. Uruka then calls out to Naruto before they leave, Hey, Naruto, let's celebrate your promotion tonight at Ichiraku's. I'm paying. Naruto was grinning at his former teacher, you're on, Uruka sensei With that, the four hurriedly left the office. Kakashi had a small chuckle as they were outside. What's so funny, Kakashi? Asuma asked who picked up Kakashi's mirth, the scarecrow Junin turned around with a red book dangling in his hand as he was giggling. Looks like I won the bet. Asuma felt sorry guy then and there when he remembered what Kakashi was talking about. Kakashi, my rival, speak of the devil. Oh hello, guy, you're just in time. Kakashi said as he greeted his self-proclaimed rival with a simple wave as he was followed by Neji and Tenten. As Tsunade Sama still inside. I have heard the most delightful news concerning about my most precious student, Lee. He asked peering behind Kakashi, Guy saw Naruto and Shikamaru chatting with each other while his mouth stood agape. Oh that's right, I forgot to introduce you to my team's first chunin, Uzumaki Naruto. Kakashi was gloating, Asuma could tell. The man really knew how to push someone's buttons especially Guy. No, Guy kneeled down on his knees and stretched his hands upwards. Oh yes. You know what that means, don't you? Kakashi asked as he gave Guy a copy of Ika Ika complete with a bookmark to a specific page. I knew Naruto performed so well during the finals but I never expected, Guy mumbled and while he was having a breakdown, Neji and Tenten approached Naruto and Shikamaru and congratulated them. For all it's worth, you two were probably the best choice. Tenten then looked at Neji who nodded. It is an honor to having fought against you, Naruto. You have my respect. Naruto grinned as he said, well, I had to really prepare for the Chunin exams. Ba-chan basically said we're still not done and we can pass a letter of recommendation for peer considerations. We were just about to leave and talk about it some other time too. Neji raised an eyebrow, who do you have in mind, exactly? Shikamaru scratched the back of his head, we still don't know if we would push it through or not. Hokage-sama said it was just an optional choice but we can ask for another participant depending on his participation after the final exam and during the invasion for promotions as peer evaluations except for the Suna Shinobi. Wait, you guys are already doing peer recommendations, too. Isn't that a little early? Tenten asked. Naruto and Shikamaru shrugged while Naruto spoke. Yeah, but with all the casualties, we need all the help we can get and just two freshly minted chunin aren't going to help very much. You need help with your recommendations. I'm sure Kakashi and I can, Asuma offered, Shikamaru had cut him off with a shake of his head. There's no need, we're not going to rush this. If we think that there's someone worthy of note to be promoted for Chunin, we'd run it over to you guys and the other Junin instructors. For now, Naruto and I would have a lot to talk about. Naruto and Kakashi had made headway after saying goodbye to Shikamaru and Asuma with the promise of Naruto discussing their peer reviews later. Once they got out of the tower, they were greeted with Jiraiya of the Sanin leaning beside the entrance of the building. Congratulations for finally becoming an official Chunin, brat. Jiraiya greeted the blonde who turned and grinned at the man. Jiraiya-sama. Kakashi greeted with a bow as Jiraiya nodded. Kakashi, I'm going to have to borrow Naruto again. Your team is waiting for you at the training grounds, no. What we will discuss is an important matter that he needs to know. Jiraiya told the masked Junin. 
Kakashi knew what the man was going to say the last meeting with the Junin had given him plenty of information as to what was going on aside from managing to bring back Tsunade from his mission. Kakashi relented as Jiraiya commanded the boy, let's take a walk. Naruto nodded as Jiraiya then continued, last night, we had a meeting, brat. Most of it concerns some disturbing information as to what happened in our absence. And although, I would have loved to tell you about this later as to another reason why I'm taking you as my apprentice, you need to know now. Naruto stayed quiet as they turned to a corner, the blonde's hands were in his pocket, the boy never made eye contact at him as Jiraiya continued, do you remember what I said to you over a month ago about powerful people coming after you? Well, apparently they made their move while we were gone. Naruto turned to Jiraiya, now alarmed, what? They infiltrated the village and managed to hold off three elite Junin before making an escape. Their target, though, Jiraiya then pointed to the blonde, was nowhere to be seen for several days around the village, they had assumed that you left under my protection which is probably why they didn't pursue you any further. I have no doubt that they are going to push their luck and come after you one of these days which is why I came here to warn you and get you up to par. Jiraiya then held out a small piece of paper to the blonde and then continued, now that things have settled down, it's time for you to learn a more in-depth knowledge about elemental manipulation. Take the paper and apply chakra to it. I want to know your elemental type to get a good grasp of your strength and your weakness. Naruto took the white paper and did as he was told. Not a second later, the paper reacted and split in half and confirming Jiraiya's suspicions. A wind chakra type, you don't get those much around here. Sad to say, I'm not even a wind type myself. What? Naruto asked in confusion. You know the time when you saw your teammate use Kaden? Or the time when Kakashi used Chidori? Jiraiya asked and Naruto nodded vigorously. Well, those are techniques that are elemental in nature and instrumental to their chakra type. An ordinary person at the start of his or her career normally has a single chakra type as you have seen now. Fire turns that paper to ash, wind cleaves it in two, lightning crumples it, earth grinds it to dust and water gets it wet. Are you with me so far? Naruto nodded rapidly, though he was disappointed he didn't get a flashier element like lightning or fire, he would just have to roll with it, like he had for most of his career. Good, now that we've established what your element is, here's a little something for you to work with. Jiraiya then handed Naruto a scroll. The blonde raised an eyebrow at this before looking back to his teacher. What is this? The boy asked, hoping it was a wind jutsu. Excitement filled his veins once more as the thought of learning an elemental jutsu not named the Tenren would surely supplement his techniques. It's something to help with your cage bunshin, brat, because you're going to need it. I only asked for your element to prepare your training tomorrow. Tsunade has granted you at least five days of reprieve before she sends you out for missions. Now excuse me while I do some research and think of ways to train you tomorrow. With that, the old man left in a cloud of smoke while Naruto unraveled the scroll. His eyes widened in surprise and gave a large grin. A variant of the cage bunshin, Arrow Senen. This is awesome. He whooped in joy as he headed out to training ground 7. Training ground 7. No way. Sakura said in shock as she looked at Naruto who was now sporting a green flak vest and giving off a grin that could split his face. You got promoted on your first try. That's insane. Sakura could not believe what she was seeing right now nor could she believe that the person in front of her is her teammate. Leave it, Sakura. Rank doesn't equate to strength. He probably lucked out with one of the qualifications for Chunin. Sasuke commented as he was swinging the wooden sword down as part of his practice. Sasuke could care less about rank. To him right now, what mattered was skill. He had seen Shikamaru earlier wearing the same vest as they went to the barbecue place a while ago and he couldn't believe it as well. It seemed like strength wasn't the only thing that the judges were looking for in Chunin candidates. Besides, he couldn't be bothered with it. Kakashi was recommending him to Anbu after all. Judges give big points for certain criteria, Sakura. One of your friends, Shikamaru, he was promoted too. Sakura was flabbergasted by it all. She simply couldn't just put it together now with Shikamaru being promoted as well. The two stupidest and laziest people in my batch get to be the first to become Chunin. How is that even possible? Naruto skipped class almost all the time. And Shikamaru couldn't be bothered to put up a pen and answer questions. He slept throughout most of the written exam for Genin, for God's sake. 
Kakashi simply waved his right hand as his focus was on his book. Now, now, don't get bent over this. Shikamaru and Naruto displayed one thing that many of the other participants lacked. Sakura and Sasuke raised an eyebrow at this as they looked at Kakashi and continued, and that's exceptional decision-making, strategizing and tactical prowess. When we reviewed the tapes of the completed fights, the judges made their decision to place their promotions on Naruto and Shikamaru. Chunin are sometimes tasked to take on leadership roles in the absence of a Junin. You understand, don't you Sakura? After all, you saw all of it yourself. Somewhat, sensei. I still find it hard to believe, though. Sakura muttered at that part. Kakashi gave a small chuckle and continued, Welcome to the world of ninja, Sakura. Things don't always seem to make sense until you figure it out on your own. How did you even brush up your skills, Naruto? A month isn't enough to change many problems you had before going to the third part of the exam. She asked, utterly perplexed from the fact that Naruto rose quickly in their ranks compared to her and Sasuke the top two students of the academy a few months ago. Naruto gave grin, well, I found a neat trick with the cage bunshin. Anything they learn, the memory transfers to me once they're gone. Sasuke widened his eyes at this, and you haven't noticed it until now. How is that even possible, Dobi? In typical Naruto fashion, he reacted more than he should have. Ah, shut up Sasuke. I didn't notice, okay. How the hell I am even supposed to know that learning that thing gives me my memories back? I had to learn the cage bunshin on the fly, bastard. Sasuke shook his head in exasperation, always read the damn fine print, Doby. Your face is telling me that you just skimmed through the rest, didn't you? Sasuke then pointed to the blonde and Naruto cringed, having been caught. S shut up, Tem. Kakashi then clapped his hands twice interrupting what could have been a brawl between his two students as he smiled and said, Now, now, infighting isn't allowed unless I regulate it. Now that you're here, Naruto, could we invite you to train with us right now? Naruto gave a grin and nodded to his sensei and the junin returned the boy's toothy smile with a simple one of his own. Great. Just in time too, I was getting worried that you all were getting rusty with your teamwork. Let's have a team exercise after your individual training, shall we? Kakashi imposed with a smile beneath his mask. Seeing Team 7 being complete again brought a smile in his face. Sakura groaned in displeasure at the prospect. Kakashi's training was hellish enough, now he felt like he needed to extend his training time just because of a team exercise. That's ridiculous. Sasuke on the other hand, seemed unfazed by it. He had to admit that he is curious of Naruto's current skill level. He had never seen the tapes that Kakashi was mentioning, but the thought of Naruto excelling and performing well enough that he was promoted to Chunin. To top it all off, he had beaten the said to be strongest genin in their current generation. Now he wanted to see what Naruto could do. Two shadow clones popped up flanking the real Kakashi in the middle and each clone motioned for Naruto and Sakura to follow him while the real one stayed with Sasuke. Now then. Let's begin your pre-initiation. When Sasuke heard those words, his eyes widened as Kakashi's demeanor changed from laid back, to downright intimidating. Drop and give me 200 push-ups, Sasuke. Knowing it's best not to protest with this personality of the man, Sasuke went on and did so with all the thought that everything he was working for, he was doing for the sake of his goal. With Naruto. Naruto unfurled the scroll given to him by Jiraiya and began reading the contents. He was giddy with excitement, not only was he going to have an upgrade for his cage bunshin, he knew for a fact that this jutsu would add a tremendous amount of new ways to his current strategy and tactics in fighting. This was a jutsu that was almost unavoidable if he played his cards right. Bunshin Debakua, great exploding clone. That's a pretty good jutsu for your style of fighting. Kakashi mentioned as he leaned down while the both of them read the contents of the scroll. To Naruto. This was a foreign technique he was about to learn, to Kakashi, this was a chance to learn about one of Uchiha Itachi's jutsus that managed to catch him and Kurenai off guard. Yeah, no more expending clones just for cover, smoke screens and plastering them with explosive notes, I can take out anyone who makes a mistake of getting close to it. Naruto mentioned as his eyes were fixed to the scroll at hand before he continued, my use of the cage bunshin would be further expanded with this and I get to save up on some of my explosive notes. It's freaking awesome. Kakashi thought to himself that maybe he shouldn't have asked for a team exercise for this. But of course, 
He needed to know how well enough had his three students grown in the time that passed since the Chunin exam. So, during your time with Jiraiya-sama, what have you learned? Kakashi asked as Naruto turned to look at Kakashi with a raised eyebrow but answered with a grin nonetheless. I can mix and match my jutsu to any way that I want, use them in creative ways and surprise opponents, but most of all, never ever get into a fight with a medic nin who know their stuff. Kakashi nodded. Jiraiya had informed him of their encounter with Kabuto and how Naruto had almost died against fighting the silver-haired man. Kakashi had to admit, being able to stand his ground against the man he considered to be of equal at best was no laughing matter even if Kabuto was a medic nin. It just showed the huge growth that Naruto displayed by leaps and bounds. Had everyone been wrong with his second most problematic student? He knew conventional wisdom did not work against Naruto. If it did, then his growth as a shinobi would be something explainable and believable but this wasn't. Naruto had the mannerisms and behavior of his former teammate, Uchiha Obito. Naruto was loud, obnoxious, clumsy, a complete idiot in every sense of the word. But Kakashi knew that circumstances create mannerisms and attitudes of people. After all, no villain is born evil and no hero as he or she is, just in the same vein that no dunce is born dumb and no prodigy is born smart. Talents mean nothing compared to actual self-realization and actualization of skill. Skills are meant to be learned by experience and not by theory alone. That, as he had thought all those years ago, is true mastery of an art form. That was personal evolution. Naruto, a boy who grew up practically neglected and emotionally abused, who had made it a point to see through things to the end, survive and become the best, it created a personality within the boy to excel in spite of his upbringing, in spite of what little knowledge he had. Kakashi had mused, Naruto's life was something akin to a fairy tale. Even more so, to what Jiraiya had envisioned in his first novel so long ago. He watched as Naruto stood up and performed a single clone. The clone went far into the clearing as Naruto had never once separated both of his hands from the middle index cross seal and from then on, began weaving his hands into four more series of seals. Suru, Hitsuji, Tora, Ryu. Bunshin Debakua, great exploding clone. Naruto shouted and watched in fascination as his clone swelled up but instead of a loud boom, a large smoke screen popped covering both Kakashi and Naruto. Still needs work. Kakashi commented while Naruto looked at his sensei. Gee, sensei, when did you figure that out? Naruto snapped, stating the obvious had never irritated him so much until now. With Sakura, swinging her wooden sticks around, Sakura couldn't help but be surprised how natural things were becoming as she went deeper with her style. It felt so natural holding the stick and swinging it as if it became an extension of her arm. Sakura had theorized and dare say that if she were to remove the factor of her weapon, she could still nail someone well enough that she can either maim or kill with it. This was a truly terrifying art and it brought chills to her bone as she thought why Kakashi would want her to learn such a gruesome and absolutely deadly combat art. The hits were quick and precise. Every part of her hand, as she visualized her opponent, would hit the person minus the added range. Jabs, swings, thrusts, she saw them all. When one of her hands would deflect block or parry, the other would strike. It was like a performance of twin dragons coiling at a single prey and aiming to kill. As she deflected a strike aimed at her left shoulder with one stick and seeing that split second stagger, she swung her right staff with a good low sweep and destabilizing her opponent's footing before she aimed for the person's chest with a quick and vicious thrust. She stopped, completely surprised. Dust danced in the air behind her. In front of her stood nothing and to her left was Kakashi who was watching her. A new technique has been born, Sakura, congratulations. What shall you name it? He asked. Sakura had no words, in the heat of her shadow fighting, she had been perfectly laid in a trance so powerful that her body seemed to have moved on its own and attacked. To Kakashi, this was something that he had foreseen yet surprised him even still. Sakura had managed to unlock the dangerous trance-like state of Yavin no Okami no Sakebi, Cry of the Savage Wolf. He was sure of it, the way Sakura had moved, the way her eyes became almost as blank as the cloudless sky. A bead of sweat escaped his forehead. This was it. Sakura had entered a state where systematic killing has been opened. Shinobuto, Dance of Death. I, I imagined two dragons coiling a single prey. It was like seeing for myself how my movements became as natural as holding my sword. Soryu no Kajo, Coil of Twin Dragons. 
Kakashi noted with a nod and said to her, Good, now let's practice with the real thing. Sakura gulped and became pale. But at the back of her mind, a little excitement couldn't help but escape her. In Azuka compound, Hiba had stared blankly down to the kennels of his clan's dogs as he began giving the canines their much-needed bath. Still can't believe the fact that your two classmates are already Chunin. A voice brought him out of his thoughts as he turned to right and saw his older sister smirking at him. Hey, you would be too if the class clown and the resident sloth made Chunin before you. Hiba remarked, now rather annoyed that he was reminded that Naruto left him in the dust. Hana gave a snort. Yes, about that, your two classmates are being regarded highly in our circle as of late. They said they were surprised that those two idiot friend of yours were doing better than most of their peers, it seems like they're reviewing the curriculum and thinking of putting up some reforms into the old system. Hana said this as she petted Kuromaru after giving the dog his current meal. She then continued as she grabbed another handful of food put into a bowl and fed to another of their dogs. I'm not surprised. Most of the things we learned in the academy are too dated and practically useless outside the classroom once we're in the field. For the most part, a modular type of education of the classic classroom is not conducive for creativity and use of different jutsus. The graduates are never thought how to strategize, just that it is merely implied once the true genin test becomes apparent. The fact that most of the fresh genin today are clan children except probably for one compared last year is a sign of a dwindling educational system that needs retooling for modern times. Hana continued as Kiba scratched the back of his head. So you think Naruto and Shikamaru are pioneers of our generation to have excelled without the approval of the academy? Hana smirked and laughed at Kiba's statement. No, pup. If anything, the two of them are catalysts. Anomalous factors that threw the whole system for a loop an aberration to age-old conventional wisdom, it's actually quite fascinating if you think about it. That means that your age group has the capacity to overtake one another now that the rules are inapplicable to you. Right now, the academy is looking into finding the next dark horse, their next wild card aside from the potential rookie of the year. Hiba raised an eyebrow at this and grinned, that means I have a chance to overtake that bastard, Sasuke and become Chunin before he does. Hannah simply snorted at this, the keyword being, chance, pup. Don't let it get to your head. Kiba looked down at Akamaru who barked at him in response after cleaning himself up. What do you think, buddy? Should we go and prove Nei san's theory correct? Akamaru barked in affirmation as Kiba grinned. I like the sound of that, boy. With that, he grabbed a now dried and fed Akamaru and put him above his head as he dashed outside leaving Hana alone to tend to the remaining dogs. That pup is eager to be an alpha. Kuromaru commented as Hana gave a chuckle. Let him try. After all, there is no shame in going after lofty goals. Besides, he needs something to motivate him. Kuromaru gave a snort. It didn't seem all too amused that the youngest pup was willing to go for such a thing that without bearing his true fangs at first. Perhaps soon can be convinced to have Kiba visit their ancestral lands due west of Konoha. Maybe he could learn a thing or two there. Yakaniku Q. I thought you said Naruto would be coming along with you so you wouldn't be able to celebrate with us. Ino said as she munched on a green bell pepper with a raised brow at Shikamaru. The Chunin simply sighed and shrugged his shoulders. Not exactly my fault. Jiraiya-sama pulled him out after leaving the tower. I think the Toad Sage is looking at a prospective apprentice. Ino laughed at the suggestion. Come on, Shikamaru. Naruto being a Chunin is far-fetched enough as it is but being apprenticed by the great Toad Sage, Jiraiya-sama. You're just pulling our leg here. Ino was about to laugh once more but stopped when Asuma wasn't smiling or that Shikamaru was thinking deeply. Right, Asuma-sensei. She asked and Asuma appeared to have returned to normal as he said, well, let's consider the following. Naruto had just earned the rank of Chunin along with Shikamaru. Nearly a month ago, there were rumors flying about that there were only two passers of the exam that were promoted to Chunin. During those times and even before that, a lot of eyewitness accounts saw Naruto and Jiraiya-sama together even though they probably have nothing to talk about. But the final piece of the puzzle was two weeks ago when Naruto left the village along with Jiraiya for a mission. Do you remember the standing order for the shinobi workforce? Ino nodded. No shinobi shall be able to take a mission unless deployed by the council with the approval of the Junin commander. Asuma nodded as he grabbed a stick of cigarette in his pocket. Exactly, 
No one is allowed to take missions until things started to wind down. Surprise! Surprise as to who went missing for two weeks under the pretense of a mission with the full clearance of the council. Jiraiya-sama being one of the Sanin, can pull an enormous amount of strings if he wishes to. Ino could nod at that, but the question still remained, but why Naruto? Shikamaru looked at his sensei without a word and only one open eye as he took a drink of orange juice. The son of the third Hokage looked rather uncomfortable answering their female teammate. Well, certain circumstances happened as to why and how. We've been debriefed earlier due to adjusting some of the roster since we'll be having two slots missing. It's really all complicated stuff, Eno. I wouldn't think too much about it. Eno looked at the older man, seemingly unconvinced as she leaned back down with her arms crossed. Suspicious. Shikamaru and Asuma raised their eyebrow at this. What? Was all Asuma could ask until Eno repeated her words. I said suspicious, sensei. There are still a lot of things that you're not telling me. And Shikamaru's look at you earlier tells me he might know something too. Shikamaru groaned, Eno, there are certain things better left unsaid. Don't try to make this all about your woman's intuition, thing because it is most certainly not. Though you really do have to wonder what brought the sudden apprenticeship of Naruto to Jiraiya-sama. Choji had finally decided to speak after stuffing his face with grilled meat. Asuma raised his hands and tried to stifle down Eno's suspicions, let's just say it has more to do with personal reasons rather than Jiraiya-sama looking for a suitable candidate. Besides, I heard Jiraiya-sama is done with taking apprentices ever since the Yandaimi died. This calls for an investigation, Eno said with fire burning in her eyes, eager to hear a scoop that could possibly be worth the goldmine. Shikamaru shook his head with an apathetic look. Sorry, not interested. Missions are going to be back on track in a few days. I'll be too busy as well as Naruto. So you should probably get nothing until you can corner Naruto. But that would be pretty hard if you ask me. Ino then asked, why? Shikamaru smirked. With Team 7's current training regimen, missions outside the village and Jiraiya-sama taking up his time, you'll find that difficult to even talk to him. Ino's thoughts of the challenge simply deflated her to her seat as Asuma gave a laugh. Well, if you really want to have good information gathering and interrogation skills, I guess I can teach you some things about that. Although I'm no expert, but a recommendation to Ibiki and Anko should probably do the trick. Ino shivered at the thought and wondered if Asuma just walked all over her grave. Outside Konoha Hospital, Hayuga Neji and Tenten were asked to remain outside the premises of the hospital when Rock Lee and Guy were ushered inside the clinic. Both of them were in solemn contemplation as to what might happen to their teammate. I hope that idiot can be helped. Seeing him looking so down these past few weeks was rather off-putting. I understand. Guy Sensei and Lee were the core that kept this team together, for better or worse. Neji replied. Tenten had raised an eyebrow. You know. You've changed quite a bit yourself. You were never this sociable when we started. Tenten replied as she scratched her head at this. Neji gave a simple smirk as he closed his eyes and leaned on the wall. Circumstances have humbled me these past few weeks and all that I have ever known were actually mere half-truths and not the totality of things. I was a fool to let my cynicism destroy me. For bearing with my state of my mind back then, I didn't know how you, Guy Sensei or Lee put up with someone like me. Tenton merely snorted and replied dismissively, my team is a team of complete basket cases and I'm perfectly fine with that. We all have our issues to deal with and we deal with them differently. It's just coping that defines our behavior whenever something pops up. Ever wonder why there are very few sane Junin on active duty? Hell, even Anbu. Neji raised an eyebrow at this, defined sane. Sane, as in normal, run-of-the-mill schmuck. You could probably count a few with your hand. The rest are people with weird behaviors that are outright disturbing to some of the civilians. Neji seemed to understand this and he nodded, I get what you mean. Guy Sensei has a tendency to show his emotions rather forwardly than most people. And I am saying this lightly. Tenton seemed to tremble in good humor to Neji's way of saying a joke. That completely threw her for a loop. Telling jokes now too, huh? Seriously, Neji, I think that beating you got from the blonde got you good and then some. Are you really Neji? Neji gave a sigh and shook his head. Sometimes he had to be the sanest man on the team and reigning in on Guy and Lee's passionate tendencies but Tenton would probably do a better job than him in containing their damn voices. By the way, 
I couldn't help but notice the nodashi that is strapped on your back, Tenton. I might assume that you plan on specializing with swords. Tenton glanced at her shiny new toy with a questioning hum before she turned to Neji to answer. Nah, as being dubbed by our batch as the weapon mistress, I intend to master this just like any other weapon. This nodashi in particular though, has a more intriguing property that it lets out. It's made from very special metals that conduct and amplify chakra by several fold and bend it to a specific element. In a way, I was planning to help out the research and development centers in exchange for ownership of the weapon. Pretty good trade-off, to be honest. Neji raised an eyebrow at this in curiosity. Sensing Neji's confusion of the weapon in her hands right now in her current situation, Tenton answered her teammate. It has more to do with collecting ores and whatnot. Rugamine San's ideas are pretty good and I have a basic understanding of metallurgy so it's a good opportunity to create more exotic weapons. Ah, was all Neji could say. A few more minutes of waiting outside earning a few more minutes of casual talk between Neji and Tenton to make up for lost time. Their talk ended when they saw Hanada being escorted outside the hospital by nurse. Hanada, what are you doing here? Tenton asked. Hanada's attention turned from the nurse to Tenton who was looking at her with a raised eyebrow of her own. Oh oh, nothing much. I I was just asked to take a monthly check up due to my injuries during the preliminary matches of the Chunin exams. She replied with a shake of her head. Neji seemed to flinch from this from what Tenton could gather. Did they clear you? She asked and Hanada gave a smile and a nod. Why yes, they did. I am now fit for active duty. Though missions don't begin in a few days with the arrival of Tsunade-sama, I'm just glad I will be able to take missions in time. Tenton looked to her side and saw Neji being silent with his eyes closed as Hanada asked, B by the way, Tenton-san, what are you and Neji Nisan doing here? Tenton smiled, we came to support our teammate of course. Lee is currently being seen by Tsunade-sama to try and look if they can fix the problem. Hanada returned a smile with one of her own as she bowed, I hope everything turns well for Lee San. He has been working hard for his career. It would be saddening if this would cripple him for his entire life. It was then that Neji spoke as he too gave a bow to his younger cousin, your concern is duly appreciated, Hanada-sama. I also apologize for what happened over a month ago. My anger has clouded me of my judgment. I intend to make amends and wish you well too in your endeavors. Tenton had raised an eyebrow at this as she asked, and that would be. Neji gave an answer as if it was the simplest thing in the world, why to get Uzumaki-san closer, of course. Let it be said that there can be nothing redder at the moment than Hanada's face as she hid it with her hands. Neji Nisan. Inside the hospital, Lee and Guy were anxiously waiting as Tsunade was reading the notes and charts left behind by several of the rotating medic nin inside concerning Rock Lee's health for the past month or so. All of the papers stacked neatly just beside the desk as she flipped through a page and sighed. I'll admit, your case is nothing out of the ordinary for trauma patients, Lee, it's just that the severity of it is quite vexing. Multiple bone fragments crushed and the fractures are too many to count. Some are probably even microscopic. Tsunade then flipped another page, that being said, you're lucky that you are still alive. Some of the fragments invaded your circulatory system. I'm surprised that after this long, you haven't developed an embolism with the extent of the fractures done to your leg and arm. Guy looked at Lee who held an expression of anxiety as he held his crutches tightly with his hands. Is there anything that can be done, Hokage-sama? Guy asked and Tsunade gave a deep breath. There probably is. But the problem would be is that it is still on an experimental state. I can't guarantee total safety for your student. This is microsurgery on a level that should be consulted with the top medics in the country. She closed Lee's progress notes and began writing on a blank piece of paper. Your operation is not something to be happy about. Don't get me wrong it is something that is completely necessary due to your condition. But I must state this as a doctor, that at most your survival in this operation is only 58%. Are you sure you are willing to continue? The odds of you surviving are technically good but as you can see, when it comes to patient care, I don't take any chances and it is completely up to you. Tsunade then gave the paper to Guy while she began instructing her subordinate, make sure to deliver that to the fire capital and tell the top medics there in orthopedics that I've returned and to make their way here in a week's time after your student says yes. That is, if he is actually willing. H. Hokage-sama. I appreciate your concern for me and I will consider what you have given me today. From the bottom of my heart, 
I thank you. Lee said in a bow as he stood up with the help of his crutches and went out of the office followed behind by his concerned sensei. Whatever happens, it will all be up to that boy. Tsunade thought as she grabbed another chart on her desk. Back in training ground 7. Kakashi was currently looking at all three of his students on the grassy ground as they sat with their legs crossed and began discussing strategy. Kakashi sensei said earlier that it was going to be a team fight and that we should come out full force at the beginning or else this is going to be like that stupid bell test all over again. Naruto replied as Sakura nodded as did Sasuke. Kakashi overheard their conversation, it wasn't as if they were being discreet about it anyway, with how they were coming up with their assignments, he was sure that most of what they'll be doing is on the fly. Right, until I can get a full understanding on how much you two can do, I say we hold out on any strategic discussions and see things for myself. The best that I can provide you two is with cover and looking for openings. So don't be surprised if you guys are suddenly protected by one of my clones or intercepts Kakashi Sensei. Sasuke gave a scoff at this, fine, I'll try to do some quick hit and run attacks to debilitate him. Sakura can provide as backup and finish the job. Naruto looked at Sakura and asked, you up for this, Sakura? Sakura had a thoughtful look for a moment before she replied, it would be better if Sasuke-kun would hit Kakashi-sensei quick enough for me to come in and finish the job with a grapple, but that would be wishful thinking, Kakashi-sensei is bigger and stronger than me at the moment. Things like grapples and throw downs will never work on sensei. Naruto nodded at this, right, we have our roles and we have our assignments, I'll provide his support and cover while Sasuke gets in and cripples sensei and Sakura finishes the job. Sasuke then looked at Sakura, can you keep up? The girl somewhat nodded, kind of, I have an idea on how to get close enough without you worrying if your maximum speed wouldn't be used to the fullest. You know discussing your strategy while I'm still here is detrimental, right? Kakashi asked while all three of his genin turned back to him with a glance. It's not like you can even tell what's going to happen next, sensei. It was Sakura this time that triggered the beginning of the match by throwing a surprise volley of shuriken to Kakashi who managed to dodge well enough after each projectile. Quick to capitalize, Kakashi was suddenly surrounded by four shadow clones on all sides as he was about to move forward. Keep up the pressure, Sakura. Naruto shouted as he generated another set of clones to clash with Kakashi as his current set was dispelled. Sasuke for his part, had disappeared the moment Sakura threw her projectiles at the man. The smokescreen laid out by Naruto's shadow clones provided perfect cover for him to move at a proper position. Crouching down below, he made sure not to make a sound as Naruto kept bombarding their sensei with clones and taijutsu. Sasuke looked closely as he examined Naruto's movements with his Sharingan. He noted that the blonde's taijutsu leveled up to decent in the last month or so and noticed that whatever gap or glaring openings he had, he covered it up with another shadow clone effectively forming an almost impenetrable wall of arms and legs. It wasn't like how each clone was doing their own thing and not covering each other's ass as he had seen before. This one looked coordinated, well managed and timed perfectly. Leadership quality, huh? Sasuke thought as he leaned forward and grabbed his wooden sword before he built up chakra to his feet. It's no wonder he beat Hayuga Neji, then. Apart from his taijutsu that can be rendered useless, he doesn't have enough of a solution to stop Naruto once he gets the ball rolling. Kakashi, however, another set of clones destroyed and Sasuke performed a single hand seal. He knew from experience that Kakashi was on a whole another level. Kakashi may not practice the gentle fist, but his versatility was nothing of the sort that Naruto has ever encountered and it was something that brought an advantageous edge over anything that Naruto could ever throw at their sensei. Multiple ninjutsu, advanced taijutsu, decent genjutsu and a working sharingan made Kakashi a force to be reckoned with the likes of which, Sasuke was sure could catch up to any of the legendary sanin. There, Sasuke immediately saw an opening and rushed from his hiding spot and leapt forward performing the shunshin no jutsu, body flicker technique. Kakashi was immediately on guard the moment that he felt Sasuke had leapt into the fray on his own. He was surprised that Sasuke had managed to close the gap between them in a fraction of a second and the boy was already in mid-swing to his torso. Kakashi twisted his body well enough in mid-air that he had narrowly evaded the strike to his stomach as he then proceeded to have one foot stomp on the blade as with his other foot, smacked Sasuke across the face as he was sent rolling on the ground only to be replaced with a Naruto clone that was under a henge and dispelling in a cloud of smoke. 
That was Uchiha Shisui's movements just now. He's learning. And Naruto's timing too. They're getting good. Sasuke once more disappeared from his view and his tracks were covered when several Naruto clones were blocking his path. He had not noticed Sakura disappear from view as well until he noticed that Naruto was by himself now. Kakashi Sensei is too good. He is better than Kabuto at hand to hand at least. Naruto noted as he created another wave of shadow clones to create zones and force an opening. Knowing Sasuke, he'll try something else. The blonde continued and as he guessed, Instead of going for close range, Sasuke had sent several fireballs Kakashi's way. The clones dispersed from the field as Kakashi was engulfed in flames while all three of them remained ever vigilant. A crack in the earth brought Naruto's senses on full alert as Kakashi popped underneath him to grab a hold of his ankle and drag him down. A shuriken was quick to fly at Kakashi's reaching hand that stopped the man from doing so as Naruto jumped back twice before disappearing with the Shunshin no Jutsu. So it's actually Sakura that's providing cover. Kakashi had to commend his team for coming up with something on the fly and try to reverse roles as quick as they can. It's not as noticeable as Naruto's tricks of the trade but it was quietly effective. Any other ninja would have fallen to their idea of tricks. They're learning faster than I had anticipated. Kaden. Hausenka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Mythical Fire Flower Technique. A hail of small but quick fireballs escaped from the rooftops as Kakashi jumped back and began weaving a series of hand seals on his own. Doden. Doryuheki, Earth Release, Earth Wall Barrier Formation. Kakashi touched the earth with his right hand just as he was about to take a turn and a wall of earth erupted from the ground as it blocked Sasuke's fireballs with ease. It was then that four Naruto clones had surrounded Kakashi once more while another stood on top of the earthen wall. All of them held a kanai in their hands as they charged at Kakashi simultaneously as the silver-haired Junin immediately went for the first clone he could grab and pulled the clone closer. Kakashi then struck his elbow downwards straight to the clone's skull as it dispelled in a cloud of smoke before spinning again once more to parry the next clone's outstretched hand holding a kanai with an empty palm and viciously breaking the clone's arm with another elbow strike to the boy's forearm dispelling it. Kakashi then swiped his arm for a clothesline at the next clone and hit it directly at the neck dispelling it with much ease. The last clone gritted its teeth and instead of attacking forward, it leapt back and let loose a hail of shuriken before it dispelled. Kakashi ducked and noticed the whizzing sound of the metal was later than what he had anticipated. It was then that he saw the real ones coming right at him fast. He rolled to the side as the shuriken became planted on the ground. Sakura used a bunshin for that one as Naruto jumped back. She used a smoke screen to cover her attack. Sneaky little kid, but still, she needs a better set of projectiles on her in order to keep up with Naruto and Sasuke. As he landed Kakashi smiled beneath his mask. Back then, when he first met his wayward Genin, they had an unspoken sense of hostility towards one another. Unlike his former team, Sasuke, Sakura and Naruto were far, far worse than him. Rin and Obito by three times. It didn't help that Sakura made things worse for both Naruto and Sasuke. But somehow, right now, watching all three of them performing so well with each other, it got him thinking that many of the things they experienced perhaps changed them to this degree. It made them forget all the little follies of life as a shinobi of the village. He lamented that he wished they were done in better circumstances but that was neither here nor there to be discussed anymore. Sasuke now had a flourishing sense of loyalty to an ideal that will give him the necessary drive as it once did Itachi. He was hoping for the better that Sasuke stuck to that ideal unlike his brother. Sakura was slowly going out of her phase as a wishy-washy girl whose priorities were not inclined for shinobi lifestyle. Naruto. How astounding was it that Naruto to straighten his act and go beyond just self-aggrandizement in order to become Hokage. From being an obnoxious, Scatter-brained kid to a shinobi carrying his best with pride, Naruto became a selfless boy that Kakashi could tell that emulated his former teammate and father well. No matter what, perhaps his sensei would be proud of Naruto anyway. I guess I should take this more seriously from now on, or else, they're going to think that they're catching up to me faster. Kakashi then grabbed a kanai from his pouch and said, you have all grown so well. For that my reward for all three of you is that I will take you more seriously now. Naruto. Sasuke and Sakura shivered all together. A few hours later. Naruto. Sakura and Sasuke were dragging themselves in Konoha as they went to their respective appointments or homes on time. 
Sakura was glad Sasuke had lived on the way to hers and Naruto had an appointment with Aruka over at Ichiraku's meaning that he was going to help her carry Sasuke all the way back home today. Sasuke. Just had to be the one to be the most, exhausted. Naruto replied with teeth clenching as he helped Sasuke up. He just tried too much, Sakura muttered. Sasuke did indeed overexert himself once more. It ended with him exhausting himself out to the point his cursed seal began to pulse and he had to stop. Does this, usually happen when, you train with Kakashi Sensei while I was gone? Naruto asked and Sakura nodded. More times than I can count. Naruto gave a chuckle at that, Sasuke, you really aren't that much different from me, aren't you? Sasuke gave an indignant huff, shut up, idiot. If I wasn't so tired, I'd deck you in the face, bastard. Like you could even do that when you're at your peak. That's enough from both of you clowns. Sakura yelled at the two who looked at her rather incredulously in utter silence as she somewhat blushed and turned away in embarrassment with a blush on her face. The first few days of being together again and were already at each other's throats, it's a miracle that we managed to stay coordinated for as long as we could against Kakashi Sensei earlier. If she had both of her hands unoccupied right now, she would be massaging her temples in frustration. Sometimes I don't get how we survive as a team. Naruto. Having lapses of being a simpleton as he is, answered in a matter-of-fact voice, that's easy, Sakura. We're awesome that way. How is that even an answer, idiot? Sasuke asked as he looked at the blonde with a deadpan question. I'll give you an answer once I shove my foot up your. Would both of you cut it out? Naruto and Sasuke eventually shut up. A few more arguments later, all three of them decided on their separate ways once Sasuke made it back to his home. Ichiraku was still a few ways away when he encountered on a bridge as he looked down on the waters below. Naruto recognized that he was probably deep in thought. Yo, Lee. Lee's thoughts were interrupted when Naruto called out to him. The boy had a weary smile on his face as he waved at the boy. When Lee saw Naruto wearing the flak jacket, feelings of jealousy rose to his stomach. A failure like him had beaten Neji and the ultimate reward was the promotion he had coveted. Lee may be happy for Naruto but he also felt petty on the boy's amazing luck and skill that rose by leaps in bounds within a month. Lee knew Naruto was the dead last of his class, yet for all of Naruto's misgivings in their career, the boy was the one who had made better strides than the rest of them. Lee could not help but feel absolutely mortified at this while holding his crutches. Naruto-kun, the boy said as he looked down, trying to suppress his feelings of envy for the boy and instead gave a smile to know that he was happy for his friend. How was the meeting with the old lady? I asked her to take a good look at you when I was with Aero Senen on my mission as a favor. Lee was surprised. Tsunade-sama had never mentioned this to him before. Naruto likely never opened up about it since the night before and only said they had to see Tsunade-sama. Somehow, his feelings of jealousy were overlapped with regret. Naruto would go this far just to help him. Yes, she has seen me and the assessment of my injuries that she has given me is not well. To this Naruto frowned, what do you mean, not well? Are you saying you can't be healed? Lee shook his head, no, no, it can be solved. It can be healed, but the problem is the procedure carries a huge risk and I might die in the process. To this, Naruto stopped and his silence spoke for them. Naruto clenched and unclenched his fist as if trying to figure out what to do or say to his friend. What could he say? What was he supposed to say? to find out that you could lose your life just so you can continue to be a ninja. Naruto admitted to himself that he could not comprehend the amount of conflict that arose within Lee's mind. Could he take that risk? Would he? He thought of whatever things he could say to his friend and clarity had hit his head for several seconds when he reached out to Lee who was about to leave. Hey, bushy brows, Naruto called out. Lee turned to Naruto who had called him by his nickname and looked in question. The blonde patted his friend on the shoulder and spoke to him in the most reassuring way possible. What's your goal in life? Lee looked confused. I don't understand what you are implying, Naruto-kun. To be a splendid ninja who can only use taijutsu. That was your goal, right? Naruto asked with a grin. Lee looked down and said. But looking at the situation now, although I wish to feel optimistic, I cannot help but feel this lingering fear that I might die in the process. Naruto then began to walk forward with Lee behind him, he looked back at Lee and then grinned. 
Bushy brows, your strength is the kind of strength that I acknowledge. You're the kind of guy that I think is cool, so go after your dream. We'll be with you all the way and I still haven't fought you properly. I want to fight you for real next time. So don't hold back. With that, Naruto left as he went to Ichiraku when he heard a voice booming from the crowd as it called out for Lee. Lee, know that whatever happens, I and your team will be with you all the way. I will risk everything to make sure you become a ninja once more. Naruto grinned when he heard those words. Those reassuring words meant for Lee to strengthen his resolve. No other person could bring that out to him other than the person who had gave him hope in the first place. If anyone could bring Lee out of his funk, it was Guy. Have you seen a boy wearing green spandex and a strange bowl cut hair with arms wrapped in bandages? Naruto turned his direction towards the source of the voice and saw a brown haired girl with a fairly cute face looking at him with worry. You're talking about bushy brows? Yeah, I just saw him back there, lady. His sensei is having a talk with him there. You can go there if you like. Naruto then pointed backwards with his thumbs by the bridge and began to walk. With that, he waved the girl goodbye and headed straight to Ichiraku. Once he arrived, Aruka was waiting for him with a smile. How was your day? Eh? Hey, so so, couldn't bond with the team, too worn out from all the training. Naruto replied as he sat down. Congratulations on being Chunin, though. I think you rightfully deserved your rank, Naruto. Naruto gave a smirk as Aruka gave two orders of miso ramen. Thanks, Aruka sensei. I'm glad I made Chunin, now we're about equals in rank. Aruka chuckled a little as he grabbed Naruto with his arm and said playfully, don't let it get to your head, Naruto. You're still far too young to be able to take me on as a Chunin. All right, all right already, Aruka sensei. Just let me go, damn it. Once Aruka let go, he had a smile on his face as Naruto did the same. Chuki came up with their order and both dug in with much gusto. When they finished, Naruto begged for another bowl while Aruka relented. It would probably be the last one though, as Naruto insisted he pay for the next should he choose to have another. Naruto seemed to have other thoughts as he dug to his ramen. The thought of Guy and the girl looking over at Lee with concern brought a quizzical and honestly curious mind up front. Hey, Aruka sensei, what's it like to love someone? Aruka choked on his food as Ayame immediately grabbed a glass of water for Aruka to down. Releasing a sigh of relief, Aruka turned to Naruto and asked him, what's with that all of a sudden? Ayame and Chuki looked on at the blonde curiously as well. Nothing, really, just curious, what's it like to give your worries for people that you care about? Ayame smiled and answered for the boy, Naruto. There are many types of love that a person can have, it has multiple facets for different people that you care about. Wait a minute, Naruto, is this about Sakura, again? Aruka asked with a scratch on the back of his head and Naruto answered with a smile on his own. This isn't about her, Aruka sensei. Like I said, I was just curious. I saw Lee earlier and he looked absolutely sad, I tried to cheer him up remind him what he wanted to accomplish in life despite the high stakes that the Hokage laid out for him earlier. Lee felt like he was denied to being a shinobi of Konoha. But then super bushy brows sensei appeared out of nowhere and saying he'd risk anything for Lee and that he was with him all the way. That was something he had no idea what to feel of. Chuki had to reply as he began filtering the noodles. So if it's not Sakura, are you over her, boy? Let me tell you. She's fine as your friend but as your girlfriend, you'll be spending most of your time throwing plates at each other, not a good sign for a healthy relationship, if you ask me. I told you, it's not about her, guys. I'm just genuinely curious. I'm not after Sakura anymore. Now it was Ayame who piled up on Naruto, really. So who's the girl now? Tell me about her or else. Naruto just groaned. Sometimes he felt like he was the one surrounded by nutcases. Let's try to give Naruto some breathing room, guys. To answer your question Naruto, I guess you could consider how I felt when you stole the forbidden scroll. Aruka answered as he gave a sheepish grin all the while scratching his cheek in embarrassment. Love comes with multiple emotions along with it, joy, sadness, anger and worry. For you to love means you are willing to throw a part of yourself for someone. Along with your worries, your anger, your sadness and your happiness, you are giving that person a chance to be a part of your circle. Like how I am with you. 
Uruka admitted with a grin as he put a hand on Naruto's head. The blonde looked down on his bowl of ramen as he felt somewhat happy with Uruka's statements. Bah, Uruka, you're no fun, Naruto just stated he's over his teammate, Sakura. That's amazing if you ask me. Naruto, my boy, it was probably for the best. Chuki dismissed whatever tripe Uruka and Naruto were getting into and headed straight for the juicy parts of their conversation. That's right, so who is it now, Naruto? It's okay to tell us, we won't spill it, we swear. Ayame decided to cut in. Naruto had promptly hit his head on the counter. Chapter 11. Flickering Flames. What is your goal, bushy brows? A beat. As Lee recalled, Naruto had him reaffirm his goals, to keep reminding him to achieve and risk everything in the name of his beliefs. We didn't even have a proper match yet. So I'll be waiting for you. In his own way, the blonde kept pushing for what Lee had always desired, a way to be recognized as a splendid ninja. Because Naruto understood his position and because Naruto himself had been subjected to the same life, Lee could somewhat understand why Naruto would be saying those words to him. Naruto-kun, I thank you for supporting me this far. Lee, know that whatever happens, I and your team will be with you all the way. I will risk everything to make sure you become a ninja once more. Guy sensei had reminded him that in his struggle, that he could never be alone. This was something that even the whole team felt as he was gravely injured. Even Neji, as Guy sensei had explained, was worried about him. Lee began questioning himself before Guy and Naruto came into view, putting into perspective how hard he had trained and how little he had gained over the years. He couldn't fathom the idea of succumbing to his injury, of how just a single second, took his entire future away. He could feel himself slipping and wasting away his vigor trying to desperately maintain his health in complete vain knowing that he may never be allowed to become a shinobi again. But Guy sensei had reassured him, made him completely sure of himself that he should not fear, he should not falter. For if he gave in now, everything he had been working for would have been for nothing. In a flash, my life is forfeit, but if I remain like this, it will be meaningless. Are you, Lee San, by any chance? Lee stood quiet all of a sudden when a girl with brown hair stood before him, a hand on her chest looking concerned at him. He looked on in wonder as to why she was looking at him worriedly. She wore a sleeveless purple kimono with the hem just reaching her knees and a pair of wristbands of the same color. Lee could not help but be awestruck to the beauty that stood before him. My name is Karama Yakumo, and I could not help but ask you of your well-being. For I have seen you train almost every day near my home. I know it must be weird for you to just see me now and notice me, but I have been seeing you and noting your progress. I have seen you push yourself to the brink of exhaustion in your training, tirelessly jog around the village to improve yourself and make a mark in history as a ninja who only uses taijutsu. I know it may not seem much to you right now, but I have been inspired by you to work harder, see to my own goals and follow my own path. I wish to be like you, Lee San. But if you take it away right now, your effort, it will mean nothing to me anymore. Like you, I wish to fight my destiny so please, whatever it is that must happen, do not give up. And with those words, Yukumo left. Lee stood there at the edge of the bridge, at a loss for words. Through my work, I have raised the spirit of one person. And in my darkest hour, this stranger who has no knowledge of what has happened to me comes to me and tells me that I have inspired her to do the same. Guy sensei is this what it felt like when I came to you all those years ago? Unnoticed by him, his eyes were closed as he looked down, hands clenched onto his crutches so tight that the wood in them began to splinter. And in that moment, he had realized, that tears were falling down on his face. I have decided, I will go through the procedure. I am a rock, and for that, I must be steadfast and unbreakable, unwavering and undeterred, for I am a rock as my name dictates and to that, I must be strong. I will be strong. Chapter 11. Flickering Flames. The light of dawn caressed the morning dew kissed lands of Konoha as the sun rose up. In its wake came the crow of roosters and the chirping of birds. To Hayuga Hanada, this was the hour for her training to begin. As she wore her robes to begin her training, her thoughts began lingering for the day about her progress as a shinobi and as the heiress of the Hayuga clan. She silently went down to the training dojo careful not to wake the others who were still very much asleep at this time. When she finally reached her destination, 
she began to warm up and stretch for a few minutes before finally sliding down to a common jukan stance. As her body fluidly performs every kata she had practiced oh so many years ago. As she moved with a grace not beholden to anyone else in her clan, her thoughts once more drifted her focus slightly. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, she had indeed improved, but by how much, she was not certain. She could not quantify her increase in aptitude as she had no one else to compare to. As being trained within the house, she had not had a chance to test her skills since the rebuilding of the village began. Although her father would approve knowingly with a nod, she could still not see how far she had gotten in her training. But during her father's training sessions with her, she had noted of Hiyashi's comment that struck her accord and one that she will never forget. Let not even a god stand between you and your goal. And the sheer ferocity she had displayed for the many days to come had shown up when she was sparring with her father or with Neji. It was probably the thought of Naruto that drove to such extents that she could overcome all sense of preservation and lose the sense of inhibition. It was as if she was the one who could, if pushed to a certain degree, do things that to others, become unspeakable to them and to herself. It had frightened her that she could be capable of murdering people in cold blood. Her father said to her once that those who lack the will to kill, lack the will to protect. It may have brought forth an impact that she was not aware of. But she knew she would not let anything happen to her family and to Naruto. Of that she swore with herself and she will do so without hesitation. When it was time to activate her dujutsu with a single seal, she looked on in surprise. Now, not only can she see the pathways of her own chakra, but she could see the multiple points to which they dispel through the body. She had now caught up to Neji's Byakugan, she could now see the Tenkatsu. She deactivated her Dujutsu and reactivated it in disbelief and what greeted her were the pathways riddled with points that she knew where chakra would be normally out of the body. Her amazement now setting in, Hanada was overjoyed seeing as her eyes had improved in such a short period of time. Although she may never become as skillful as Neji, she knew that she was eventually going to try. She activated her bloodline once more to get used to seeing the Tenkatsu present in her body. Now that this step of the Byakugan has been unlocked, she can now finally learn two important jutsu that she was dying to learn. She had learned that as any first step in mastering any jutsu, they must study first to understand what jutsu they are about to learn before expanding on it. She sat down on the wooden floor and closed her eyes to meditate and focus on her eyes, to get the feel of using her new Byakugan and to challenge herself further. Her concentration would last for at least half an hour before she closed her eyes to stop from straining them. She breathes out a sigh of relief as she got up. It was time to change and eat breakfast after taking a bath, she had been informed by her sensei before her mission outside that they were going to be having missions again and it would start today. They were to report to the Hokage's office immediately as of 8 in the morning. It was now half an hour past 6. She hoped that the mission would be short and uneventful. The excitement of her new Byakugan had brought forth an enthusiasm she had thought she never had. Hokage Tower. Uzumaki Naruto gave a yawn as he stretched his arms on the way to the Hokage's office. Flexing his neck side to side, the boy looked over to his right and saw Shikamaru who was yawning the same as him but instead of stretching, he slumped his shoulders down. So early in the morning for a summons, Shikamaru mumbled as Naruto had a bead of sweat at the back of his head. I usually start the day at least an hour earlier by comparison, but it's already 8 in the morning to be too early. It had been almost a week since the inauguration ceremony happened and several more days since his training with Jiraiya begun. The man had done his part of homework by consulting Sarutobi Asuma on the ways to train in elemental chakra and had been subjected to cutting leaves for two days before finally performing a clean cut across the stem of the leaf with the help of his clones. Jiraiya's teachings were actually much more lecture-oriented this time as elemental training tended to be something that was different from his training with the Rasengan. Jiraiya had to teach him the basics to get creative and had since been supervising the boy's training with it. As of now, Naruto had nearly learned how to apply chakra to a weapon to increase its range and subsequently, offensive power. Jiraiya had told him that Fudan chakra was so sharp that almost nothing could stop it from cleaving everything in its path. Another event that occurred during the past few days, Suna and Konoha had come to a decision and a deal. Although Suna had more to lose, they couldn't risk their only Jinchuriki falling to another village's hands. Konoha had one biju enough to topple over several countries. 
They certainly wouldn't need Suna's own Jinchuriki to be used by a village that they had betrayed a few weeks ago. Gara, Tamari and Konkuro left without much of a goodbye to the people that knew them. Gara, however, came to say his farewells to Naruto as they were by the western gate with Gara's promise of aiming for the seat of Kei's cage much like what Naruto was doing for the seat of Hokage. As they knocked onto the door of the Hokage's office, Naruto saw a sight that surprised him. Standing before him were members of his team and teammate. With Sasuke now sporting a real katana just on his back, light white armor that protected his upper torso and a pair white lightweight black arm guards that reached just below his elbow as he gave a stoic look at them and then turning towards the Hokage. Sakura was now sporting a longer pair of sandals that reached just slightly below her knee, making it more like a pair of boots than anything else and a pair of black gloves that covered her hands as well as a pair of beige elbow guards. To the other side, stood teammate with Kiba now sporting a pair of bandages on his hands as Akamaru sat on top of his head while he wore his hood. He wore a pair of black knee guards that overlapped his navy blue pants. From what Naruto could tell, it looked more like Kiba had some form of accident rather than additional accessories for his wardrobe if the band-aid to his nose wasn't an indication. Shino, however, now stood with a small corked gourd on his hip and his former jacket was replaced with something with a much duller hoodie. Other than that, nothing has changed much from him. It was Hinata that caught him off guard. Instead of the baggy, definitely thick sweater that she wore, she wore a much thinner wardrobe that was modest enough but wasn't really that form-fitting as the sleeves were still loose enough for her arms and a small obi tied primly on her waist and her usual grey pants that reached just below her knees. Naruto could tell that the long sleeves overlapped her hands as they remained obscure and he could definitely tell that Hinata looked stunning in her current attire. Now that you two are here, let's begin. Tsunade then handed a brown folder to Shikamaru with a label at its upper left corner written as, C. With the commercial district slowly recovering since the attack, we need some people to recommence trading with neighboring villages and countries to jumpstart our economy again as well establish new ones. We've received a formal letter from Wave Country that they would like to become an economic partner as well and has since provided us with a list of materials that they are willing to trade for some of ours. She then turned her head and pointed a finger to the two chunin in the room casually and said, Unfortunately, Kurinai and Kakashi are preoccupied with a mission of their own, so your teams are stuck with two team leaders for this mission for them to get a hang of things. Don't worry, this isn't too much trouble, just a simple escort mission of a caravan to wave country. Sakura, Sasuke and Naruto looked at each other and shuddered at the thought. The last time they took a mission to wave, it involved the machinations of a corrupt millionaire and his syndicate intent on monopolizing the entirety of the country by violence. Tsunade-sama, did anyone bother to proofread the mission? Sakura asked rather nervously and the woman in question raised her eyebrow at it. Don't worry, we've made sure to read through the text this time. The chances of you encountering a shinobi of Zabaza's caliber were one in a million. I doubt it would happen again. Shikamaru mumbled something about lightning never striking the same place twice, but Naruto chose to ignore it in favor of Kiba whining about something. Why do we have to take orders from you two, again? And the blonde was looking quite as irate as ever at it. It's because we passed the exam that you otherwise failed, mutt boy. Shikamaru shook his head and held the bridge of his nose. Two minutes in and were already at each other's throats. Do I really have to deal with this? Sakura merely scoffed at it. Try spending a month in my shoes and see if it's bad. Stop being a baby already and be a man. Naruto, don't antagonize anyone anymore. Naruto merely clicked with his tongue and said, Fine, I'm taking the high road from here. Let's all meet up at the southern gate within an hour. Pack for several days of travel, we'll probably need it. Sakura and Kiba looked at each other in surprise as Kiba mumbled, I've never heard of Naruto conceding to an argument before, what gives? Sakura merely replied with a shrug, you got me there. The Naruto I know would never let even the slightest argument go against his favor. Having bigger responsibilities tend to turn someone different, as they say. Shino had butted in causing Sakura to yelp and Kiba to look in exasperation. We weren't exactly talking to you there, buddy. Kiba remarked with a bead of sweat at the back of his head. Of course, the fact that you were whispering amongst yourselves while I am behind you automatically puts me out on a conversation between friends. Shino remarked as he walked away from the two. Silence reigned between the two as they went out the office. I can't honestly tell if he's sad or mad. 
Sakura muttered. Kiba had to nod sagely. Well, he's probably just sulking. He can't stay mad for long, anyway. Kiba remarked offhandedly and made a note to himself to apologize to Shino later. Hanada, to her credit, never spoke a word during their conversation, preferring to listen more about Naruto's changed behaviors recently, it probably had to do with his promotion and as Shino said, more responsibilities being given to his shoulders. Not that Shino ever knew of Naruto's responsibilities that made her all the more attracted to the blonde, but Shino had a point nonetheless concerning many of Naruto's new attitudes since after the invasion. Naruto seemed so composed and poised enough that it had started an inquiry within her. She made it a point to ask Naruto about his recent activities once they were on the move and it would be best if they were alone. She could not handle it if she were to be noticed by not only her teammates, but with Naruto's as well and the ever guile Shikamaru. I must muster my courage more often, she thought of this mantra over and over again as they went their separate ways and headed for home to pack. Naruto, on the other hand, was a nervous wreck internally. This was the first time he was about to lead a team for a mission. Sure, it was awesome that he was being recognized as being leader material, but this time, he was going to apply it further than just using his shadow clones on a real mission. Like any person who was tasked into taking a new job or something entirely different, Naruto himself was not immune to the anxiety of pressure. Shikamaru, from what he could see, certainly felt like he was simply hitting his stride well enough but he was just good in acting well under pressure. Too bad for him, the laid-back attitude wasn't with him compared to the Nara. As he thought about the possibilities of what the mission would entail when going to wave, he had a run-in with Rock Lee who was looking much chipper than what he was a few days ago. Good morning, Naruto-kun. Lee greeted with a salute and a grin on his face. Naruto couldn't help but grin back as well. Well, what's gotten you in a good mood today, Lee? Tomorrow is the date of my operation, Naruto-kun. It is time that I put this injury behind me. I wish to partake in training once more and become a splendid shinobi for my hard work. Naruto had to raise an eyebrow at this, just last week you were having a hard time trying to decide what you should do, what changed that. To this, Lee's eyes fired up and burned with the all too familiar passion he always had. You have reminded me what I should continue to aim for and made it a focus on my goals, Gai Sensei has told me that he and along with my team, they are with me until the very end and for that, I have nothing to fear. But there was this girl, who told me that I inspired her to become better, to be something worth more than she was and modeled her mindset in the same manner as mine but with a different method. Lee had tears falling down his face as his free hand clenched into a shaking fist. I was touched by her words and had truly made me desire to take the risk, Naruto-kun. With just my work I was able to inspire her to become better for herself. Do you know how it feels to be acknowledged like that for your effort? Naruto could only think of one thing when Lee spoke those words to him. It reminded him of his conversations with Hinata. I kind of do, actually. He said with a smile that was sincere in thought. It is more uplifting than any of Gai Sensei's praises and more hearty than a congratulatory message. For once, I am looked upon as a person worth following and for that, I am glad. As Lee started to limp away, Lee turned back to Naruto. Please wait for me, my friend and rival, Naruto-kun. I will be healed in no time and soon, we will have our match. Naruto merely grinned and waved at Lee as he walked away. An hour later, most of the team for the mission were standing or leaning just beside the gate as the caravan of 14 wagons stood in line going out. Once Naruto had arrived, he and Shikamaru had to talk with their employer and begin doing an inventory count. Here's the item list of what I have and how many there are in them. They have been arranged by their materials and in nailed crates so you don't have to worry counting every single produce. The merchant was a rather plump man with black to gray hair of middle age going for his fifties, wearing a long and somewhat regal dark blue yukata with a long-sleeved haori as he handed over the scroll for the inventory. Well, it's not like anything is too valuable in the boxes anyway, we're just produce traders and we're sharing some of it for some of their more fine seafood. The man remarked with a laugh as he got up into one of the wagons and continued, Now then, if we have no more queries, then off we go. Once they were on the road, Shikamaru and Naruto both agreed to split up and guard two wagons each. Kiba took the first two, followed by Sasuke then Shikamaru, Sakura, Shino, Naruto and lastly Hanada. He gave a simple wave at her with a grin and she shyly waved back at him. 
To the passengers watching this unfold, especially amongst the women inside the wagons, they began gossiping to themselves with words like, how cute, absolutely adorable, and they're perfect. The gossiping would continue for at least half an hour until they all exhausted themselves and promptly began to doze off. It was at this time that Hinata had managed to catch up to Naruto, finally mustering up the courage she had within herself. N Naruto-kun, see can I have a moment of your time? Naruto once more had his attention to Hinata who looked at him with a shy but nonetheless sincere smile. Naruto had raised an eyebrow at this and performed a cage bunshin to guard his portion of the caravan and slowed down to pace with Hinata's side. What's this about, Hinata? See congratulations in making Chunin. I I knew you could do it. Hanada tried to sound excited at the prospect and she thought she failed to look convincing at that. Naruto grinned and turned his head upwards looking towards the sky, thanks a lot, Hanada. That means a lot to me. I probably never would have beaten Neji if it weren't for you. Hanada was then reminded of the day that they spoke just before he fought Neji. She shook her head at this, denying herself that she had done anything that deserved credit for Naruto's win. I it wasn't me. Naruto-kun. I it was about you, why you beat Nejimi san fair and square. Naruto looked at Hinata still wearing that smile on his face as it turned to a grin, what are you talking about? You made me affirm just how much I've worked for my position. I can't take all the credit. That would be unfair for you. I I'm sorry, I. Naruto merely tapped her shoulder and said, stop apologizing, all right. You're a wonderful person. You're absolutely better than what you think you are. I know that and probably everybody that knows you maybe knows that. You just have to see it. Years of verbal abuse must have left Hinata pretty much a shrinking violet thus her shy nature. Naruto may not be the brightest person in the village, but even he could tell there were signs of abuse on a person, being one of its victims as well. For a moment, he frowned, the thought of a sweet girl like Hinata being treated that way brought forth anger that he couldn't fathom for a second as he tried to calm himself down. N Naruto-kun. A mention of his name brought him out of his dark thoughts. He looked at Hinata who was looking at him with worry and he replied with a smile. Don't worry, it's just one of these times that I tend to overthink things. It's just that ever since I've become Shunin, I've been worried over and over if I can even do this right. Deciding to believe Naruto for now, Hinata merely gave him something reassuring, and Naruto-kun, I I'm sure that you will do fine as Chunin. I if you're worried about us, I I understand that and I I'm happy that you are concerned. B but please don't carry everything by yourself, T trust us to do the right thing, okay. Naruto then happily gave a nod to Hinata as he said, I can always feel confident whenever I know that you're with me, Hinata. Thanks. Hinata simply blushed at his words. Naruto, for his thoughts, remembered something as they walked along with the caravan. This reminds me of the time when we first came to Wave Country. Naruto quipped out loud as Hinata looked at him curiously. I I've heard the stories from other people that the M mission details were falsified. Hinata had quipped and Naruto nodded. Yeah, but I understood old man Tazuna at the time. He wanted to free his people from Gato's dirty hands. Naruto said, recalling the bitter memories of Wave Country. The day that he had lost his grand vision of what it was like to be a real shinobi. Granted, he still dreamed of the great adventures that literally made up of his childish fantasies, but the day he saw people getting killed during that time was like a stone thrown at an ornate and fragile glass. It made him seem weak to the world at large. I is that why you chose to continue the mission? Hanada asked, seemingly worried over him about what he had encountered during that time. But she could somewhat tell that Naruto was handling it well enough. Yeah, that is part of it. I just couldn't take Gato's way of bullying the people of Wave lying down. Somehow, Gato had to be stopped one way or another. Thus, he told the tale of his team's mission to Wave Country in his point of view, he left no detail out such as encountering Inari and even Haku who he had disclaimed as mistaken for a girl. At first, Hinata felt quite jealous of the fact that Naruto had eyed on someone who he described as prettier than most girls he knew but quickly somewhat giggled when Naruto explained to him that he had been fooled into thinking that Haku was a woman. Naruto, even if it was for his expense, laughed embarrassingly at that story when Hinata giggled. He felt so at ease with this person. Then came the time he had told him about the fight he had with Haku and teaming up with Sasuke. 
Naruto explained everything in vivid detail at that one as his memories were a little vague on that particular event. He had recalled losing control of his emotions and feeling the rush of battle burning in his veins like Quicksilver. Hanada once more, looked worriedly at Naruto as he seemed to drift off in that memory lane as his features darkened. It didn't look like Naruto was being warm all of a sudden. She was looking at his face fading to a sense of stoicism and inner fear that she had never seen before in him. When she looked into those deep blue eyes, they were whose eyes resembled closely to Gara, Sasuke and even her cousin Neji. It was a terrifying sensation altogether. A side of Naruto that she clearly hadn't seen ever, it was dark, empty and filled with a void that was slowly consuming his sanity. I could feel the ice shattering from my punch. What Sasuke couldn't beat down, I destroyed so easily in that state of anger. It was a different feeling, it was too strong. The Kyubi had injected his chakra with mine and amplified my anger so much that all I could see was red. It was a dark place, Hanada. Something that even today, it scares me very much. If I even stumble and sink deep, I don't even know if I can ever come back up again. He looked into his right hand as it clenched into a fist, remembering the claws that grew at his nails as he swiped at Haku's mask in feral anger and unstoppable rage. Blood was pouring from his hand, a mixture of his and Haku's blood well within them. Of course, he knew well enough of Kurama's tendencies to manipulate his emotions to a certain degree and he knew that even if he was like that he had to find a way for him and his prisoner to get along just for Kurama to stop such torture. Hanada, in a moment of courage, held his clenched fist with both her hands. Do not hold on to those memories anymore, Naruto-kun. You are here today, you are alive, and you are safe. You do not have to keep this within you. That's not it, Hanada. What if, what if I hurt anyone I cared for in that moment? What if for some reason, I hurt you with it? It's too much even for me. Naruto said as he stopped his eyes closed and couldn't bear the thought of hurting his most precious people. Then we must learn. Like we always have and you will find a way. I know you, Naruto-kun. I know you so much that every time you keep struggling, that it too, becomes my struggle just to understand what you are going through. I cannot fathom the burden placed upon you, but I can be here to help you. I will not be afraid of you, Naruto-kun. No matter what, I'll be with you. Because you are. In this moment, she was blushing hard due to her shy demeanor. But her smile had truly shone forth. Naruto looked at Hinata in such a new light at this very moment. He could feel himself fading away from his own worries. Because you are also precious to me. Ba dump. It was in this moment that Naruto felt his heart beat faster too, in his personal view, a radiant and glowing sight. In turn he had to hide a growing blush on his own cheeks as he looked away. Was Hinata, always this pretty? Naruto couldn't recall the time that he paid attention to her. He can blame his weak attention span for that when he was younger. It had hit him like a ton of bricks of how much he had missed someone like Hinata, for all her meekness and shy nature, she was possibly the one that he could have grown to have a bond with deeper than most of his other friends just like with Aruka. Regrets were possibly the one thing Naruto didn't want in his life. For all of his very limited things that he would always consider important, regrets were the last thing he had wanted in his life. His own reminders to not take things for granted sometimes couldn't be applied to himself. He sighed as he thought of what a waste it was to squander away all that he could have ever wanted in one person who accepted him wholeheartedly in his own age group. Did Uruka sensei have an idea when we were still in the academy? What would he think about Hanada? Hanada however, held on to his right hand firmly but also gently as possible. What she was doing was strictly out of her own nature. But if Naruto could afford to be someone who looked like he wanted peace of mind, who, as she had known, become as every bit of human as anyone else and who could have very well had become someone else entirely, then she was entitled to become a person who he could lean on and put him at ease, someone who he could talk to even beyond that of Sasuke and Sakura. Their thoughts were completely derailed when they heard several women gasped and gave a quiet squeal inside the wagons as they looked at both Naruto and Hinata. The two shinobi merely blushed and just as quick as lightning, Hinata had let go of Naruto's hand and stared at the ground she was walking on. Naruto had to quicken his pace and go back to his original post as Hinata did the same. Naruto for the first time, looked at his right hand and the image of his clawed hand were changed with his normal one but now, Hinata's hands were present there and her lingering touch had made him feel somewhat disappointed that it could not last much longer. Soon, 
It was nightfall and the group had to take set up camp while the shinobi had begun setting up traps and drawing lots on who should take the nightly watch. Shikamaru was disturbed when the leader of the caravan had called for him to ask a few questions with a nervous laugh. I am deeply sorry for disturbing your operations, Shinobi-san. But my wife and my daughters are here hounding me with questions and all. Shikamaru sighed. What is it about? One of the girls, the youngest, Shikamaru presumed, had raised her hand and asked him, who is that boy with the blonde hair? Shikamaru raised an eyebrow at this, that's Uzumaki Naruto, he's like me, a newly promoted chunin. May I inquire as to why you are asking about him? It was then that the women began to swarm him with questions that involved his peer. Shikamaru had cursed his luck in Naruto then and there. Damn you, Naruto. Because of you, I'm in hell. After setting up their traps, the shinobi had agreed to rest with Kiba taking the first shift as they all went to their respective tents. Before he had left to take to the treetops, Kiba noticed a peculiar event ever since leaving Konoha. He had gathered that it was more out of casual talk than anything else, but Hinata was almost never one for such things as she was the type to listen more and speak later much like Shino was. If anyone was the one to start a conversation, it was him. Yet from what he had observed, Hinata and Naruto were beginning to trade words well enough as if they were the longest of friends. He had raised his eyebrows at this. Then when they were setting up traps and gathering dried wood for a fire, Naruto and Hinata came back together and almost ignored them once they dropped the pile of wood that they had collected. Curious, he muttered. Great, now he was mumbling in the same rhetoric like Shino. Whatever the hell it is that Naruto has done to his teammate, it certainly seemed to improve the chemistry that existed between them. So Kiba had one thing in mind as he got to the treetops. Well, if it gets Hinata out of her shell, then I'm all for it. She needs it after all. Morning had come from what was a peaceful evening. The merrymaking of the merchant family was very lively the night before but it was not unbearable for the ninja to rest their bodies. By now, Sasuke had noted that they were already past halfway on their trek to wave and they would be arriving later this afternoon. He noticed the atmosphere was getting slightly cold as they went and the merchants had explained that this was the time where winter was fast approaching. He was glad to have read the mission report and had packed well enough just in case he might need it. Looking back, he saw the same equipment being brought out by his current teammates and even Naruto packed to bring his as well. The harshest of teachers gives his lessons well. The life of a shinobi changes everyone, even the most staunch and most stubborn of shinobi always fall to the hands of change. There are no exceptions. Those words were uttered by his father who had warned him of the impending change that any shinobi will go through in their life and Sasuke gladly took those words with him as this was the last lesson his father had told him before he was killed. Sasuke shook his head. It would not do well to recall painful memories that involved his family while on a mission. A simple distraction could cost him dearly. Once they had arrived in wave country, they were met with a sign on an arc that perplexed most of his teammates and excited Naruto. Awesome. They named a bridge after me. Naruto was shouting and pointing to the name of the bridge while Sasuke pinched the bridge of his nose while shaking his head. Great, we wouldn't be hearing the end of this while we're here. Looking over at Kiba, he noticed the canine lover had figuratively dropped his jaw on the floor as he was looking over at the sign that stretched wide at the entrance. Gah, breathe, Kiba, Shino reminded but was only met with a single incomprehensible phrase. Ga, Naruto held a steady grin as the group crossed the bridge to the other side. Once they were finally in what was officially wave country, the townspeople quickly recognized Naruto, Sasuke and Sakura and were promptly swarmed over by the people of wave. They're back, the heroes of Nami. Pretty soon, the whole town was flocking towards the members of Team 7 particularly to Naruto who even had a following in the country in the form of young women swooning over as he was ganged up by the over-appreciative mob. Naruto-sama, Shikamaru looked on with a bead of sweat at the back of his head while Kiba was shaking in pure jealousy to his friend and current superior. Well he's been busy, Shikamaru remarked, and then something chilled him to the bone as if he was feeling as if the Shinigami was walking beside him. The hair on the back of his neck was standing upright as he glanced to his right peering at Hinata who was only smiling while her eyes were closed. She was unleashing a little bit of her killing intent without even knowing about it as she looked on at the crowd. Akamaru was cowering beneath Kiba's hood and covered his head with his forelegs and decided not to show himself until the bloody violence was over. 
It would be prudent if we disperse the crowd. We would not want an incident to occur during our stay here, Shikamaru-san. Shino reminded as the other Chunin side and gave in to Shino's advice to disperse the crowd. But seeing as they were relentless, Shikamaru wasn't so sure on intervening much. Those ladies were all savagely eyeing his blonde teammate. Naruto ni san. The seven shinobi all turned around and saw a kid with a fisherman's cap running towards them while waving his hand. The boy had a slightly spiky pattern for his jet black hair, almost reminiscent of an Uchiha, but this one looked much more sociable than the only actual Uchiha that they personally knew. Sasuke couldn't help but scowl for some reason. Inari. Naruto quickly recognized the boy and gave the child a high five. You're back. And you brought more friends with you. The boy pointed out with a grin, glad to have seen his brother figure once more. Naruto returned the boy's grin with his own and replied, Well, we're officially on a mission in Nami no Kuni. Can we maybe go to your grandpa's place so we can talk? Inari nodded immediately and dragged the shinobi towards the house of their former client. Sasuke then thought it best to stay behind and guide the merchants to their destination and current lodgings before catching up with the rest of the team. When they began scouring the town, Sasuke noticed that the price of the shops significantly dropped. The former destitute small town in shambles back then was slowly recovering, with electricity back in every home and the shacks began turning to proper and strong housing projects. The town's overall depressed atmosphere was now being replaced by a much more welcoming bunch of people. The small fishing town was slowly turning into something worthwhile for many other people. No one is exempted to change, everything changes sooner or later. Sasuke thought, he could hear the laughter of children and several villagers echoing in his head as they traveled throughout town. His hands in his pockets, Sasuke turned to the right and then casually pointed their clients to an affordable but good inn. Sasuke turned back, having done his job and vanished from the scene in nothing but a cloud of white smoke. Tazuna's house. Naruto whistled as he looked at the house that was once humble. From what he could see, the house that stood just outside of the small fishing town was expanding. Lumber was neatly stacked just behind or near the house and it looked like Tazuna decided to add another floor to his house as well. Are you super impressed by the architecture, brat? Naruto turned to the source of the voice as did most of his colleagues and saw an old man standing just behind him. His features were as Naruto had callously described, an old man with messy silver to white hair, a pair of glasses for his blurring vision, a mustache connecting with his beard forming a goatee, wearing plain brown clothing suitable for his occupation and a gourd of sake on his right hand. Like from what Sakura and Naruto can remember Tazuna, he still reeked of alcohol, much like their current Hokage only less pleasant to look at. Grandpa, Inari, exuberant of seeing his grandfather, ran to the old man with a grin on his face as Naruto looked at the old man with a grin on his face. Tazuna-san. It's been a while, we're so glad to see you. Sakura greeted with a smile, but she stayed far away as possible. The man reeked of alcohol and in no way was she going to get close to the man who made the thing part of his system already. That you, Sakura, what did you do with your hair? Tazuna asked as he squinted his eyes at the girl as he walked over to them. I thought your teammate liked long hair. Suddenly had a change of heart and decided to move on. The old man continued, Sakura just shook her head as to what Tazuna was implying. It's not like that, Tazuna-san. I sort of had an incident a few months back when we were taking the Chunin exams. Tazuna had that, uhhh, expression on his face as turned to Naruto and asked him about his current life. What happened to the orange, brat? Please tell me you wizened up and threw that monstrosity away. Tazuna remarked as Naruto's grin never faltered but a tick mark appeared just behind his head. To his back, Shikamaru and Kiba were laughing their asses off. Assholes. Actually, most of my getup was ruined a few months back. But I still have some orange with me after I was promoted. Naruto then unfastened his vest to show the orange part of his long-sleeved shirt. Tazuna scratched his chin for a moment and then answered. Well, it wouldn't be the same brat if he changed so suddenly in a few months. And a promotion. Don't tell me you actually have a head on those shoulders now. To this, Kiba and Shikamaru were already supporting each other with their hysterical laughter. Another tick mark was added just behind his head. I swear to the sage, if those two idiots laugh any harder I'll tear their guts out. Tazuna looked behind the blonde and saw several new faces. Four to be exact. 
He looked back to the blonde and gave a small grin. Friends were good to have. He had heard from their sensei that the boy was possibly as lonely as they come. He had put up walls most would never be able to break and his mind was completely locked down to those who were willing to open up to him. It wasn't really noticeable until Kakashi had pointed it out. The constant smiles and the sociable behavior that the boy displayed were more than likely to be false constructs and a defense of the mind to not leave itself completely insane. In a way, Naruto may be stable, but that stability hung by a very thin and very poor thread. In a way, the boy was far, far more messed up than his other teammate. Where's your other teammate? Naruto shrugged, he's escorting our clients to a nice inn that they could stay in for several days. We'll be here for a few more days so we've packed for a week's worth of supplies. Tazuna nodded, straightened up and walked towards his house, calling out his daughter as he did so. The extra guest rooms are all finished. You and your friends can stay there. No need to spend money on an inn, my boy. You're in luck too. We're having a festival in just two days. Yeah, you could stay with us and maybe you could tell us all your adventures during your stay. Inari butted in, eager to have Naruto inside their home once more. Oh no, we don't mean to impose, Sakura was first to try and turn down that proposal as soon as possible but Tazuna shrugged it off. Please, I now have more money than what I can do with it. Since being free from Gato, we've been having a large influx of cash in trade and commerce. Let's talk about this more inside once your other teammate gets here. A few minutes later, Sasuke had arrived and Tazuna once more gave a callous comment. Sasuke didn't seem to care though and roughly just ignored the frivolities of a drunkard that he had come to know for the past few months. Once inside, Naruto introduced everyone to Tazuna's family and vice versa. It was then that Tazuna asked for another question. Your sensei is not with you. The three shook their heads, Sakura was the one to inform him, Kakashi sensei is on another mission. We're stretched thin since the invasion. Tazuna seemed to nod at that, ah, I've heard about that. Frankly, I was worried about your team when news came out that Konoha was invaded by two nations with one of them being a major village at that. I trust everything turned out okay. The Konoha shinobi all had different expressions, Shikamaru was the one who answered, we managed to weather the storm but we've lost a lot of comrades from the attack, including our Hokage. Tazuna seemed to recall an old man who wore a strange hat as he read his mission profile. He seemed nice enough from what Tazuna could tell. You have my condolences then. In their small talk, they talked about what happened during the invasion, each shinobi told their story from their point of view right up until the climactic battle between Naruto and Gara. To say that Inari was impressed was an understatement. Their small talk turned from the exploits of the Konoha shinobi to the surging economy of Nami no Kuni. The old man had stated that their fishery was one of their main economic strengths and provided more money and food on the table than any of their other monetary exploits. Gato's floating funds were a great jumpstart for Nami no Kuni. The money was used to improve a whole lot of things that the townspeople needed to repair damaged tools and boats for fishing. They didn't have to spend a whole lot or didn't spend anything at all to revitalize their town. In what seemed to be an impossible task turned easier with the money Gato left behind. It's all thanks to this little thing. Tazuna then showed to them a small black marble-like object and placed it on the table. A black pearl, huh. I bet this thing sells quite a ton. No wonder you all got back to your feet so quickly, Shikamaru remarked, looking at the black pearl in his fingers as he picked it up. Tazuna gave a nod, a whole lot, actually. Because of this, we've managed to get more agricultural products ranging from grain to vegetables and even livestock. The cost of living has decreased greatly and many of the people here aren't starving anymore, labor has become quite stable and I don't usually have to struggle for lumber supplies anymore what with the bridge and all. It was easy to forget that the old drunkard was also a businessman. That being said, I now understand why Gato was hell-bent on controlling this place. He saw something and that something turned out to be a natural resource that we had in our midst and also to have a strong foothold for his organization. He was making Nami no Kuni the center point of his supposed empire. The old man then turned his attention back to the pearl once Shikamaru handed it over to him. A single pearl like this costs millions of ryo due to its rarity and oddity. Many noblemen and women use this as a status symbol of wealth and power. Pretty damn useless, if you ask me, nobles are flamboyant like that. I'm surprised this thing is worth so much. 
I'd have probably traded this for some sake over here. Sasuke scowled at the old man's story, won't bandits try their luck and pillage this town? Tazuna gave a sigh. That's unfortunately one of the problems the country has right now and it will probably get worse as this country gets better. So far, the bandits around here have been few to minimal and it's nothing we can't handle. But I don't know how much longer we can hold them off until we need to ask for some help. I heard that some of the members of those bandits were remnants of Gato's thugs. He slightly turned his sights towards Naruto as subtly as possible, possibly trying to guilt trip him once more. Sasuke rolled his eyes at this while Sakura flinched. Shikamaru however, quickly picked up on the cue and said, we'd be willing to lend our services, for a certain price. Shino nodded his head, as we should. We will be keeping this under the books however, as this is a kind of transaction that is not an official one approved by the Hokage. Tazuna seriously had the nerves to jump back but didn't act on them when he remembered they also had an obscure looking ninja with them as well. Shikamaru and Naruto looked at Shino before the two looked at each other with a single nod. So who's going to make the call? Kiba asked. Shikamaru and Naruto were looking at each other. The smarter of the two then explained his thoughts on the matter. This is basically a mission that isn't listed so whatever we encounter, we are on our own and we don't know the first thing about our enemies. If you don't want to be punished, then sending for reinforcements is not a good idea if push comes to shove. On the other hand, we can establish a good trade route here and expand further our economic partnership with Nami no Kuni. This is a high risk, high reward scenario. If I were to make a call, I'd say we just skip this whole troublesome thing, ask for backup and let them handle it, but I'm not the only one here who can have a decision. All eyes turned to Naruto who was looking at them with that emotion as if he was asking if something was wrong. I don't see the problem with helping them. Kiba then added his opinion on it too, well, sure. Why not? It's not like we're going to deal with dangerous ninja over here. Shikamaru held the bridge of his nose, that would have to be determined. Nami no Kuni is a fast-rising nation economically in the continent, Kiba. You think that Kiri and Kumo would not have heard of this by now? Don't kid yourself. Sasuke then said his piece, Kiri is too busy with their civil war, last time I checked. And Kumo would have to cross either a vast ocean or Hino Kuni's borders to get here. This is a good opportunity to test ourselves. We can write this as an unfortunate encounter with the local bandits, no harm, no foul. What about sleeper agents? Possibly from Suchi no Kuni? Sakura asked. It's a possibility, but it's a far stretch. Suchi no Kuni has been quiet for a long time and recently one of their biggest major economic giants is the mining industry and that is a boon for them. Going to Nami no Kuni is completely unnecessary. But like Sasuke said, they would have to cross Hai no Kuni's border first before they make it to Nami no Kuni. Shikamaru replied. T then our biggest concern would be, Hinata trailed off as she understood what Shikamaru was now concerned about. Shikamaru finished the statement for her, missing Nin who are looking for an opportunity to get rich quick. Naruto looked at Sasuke and Sakura and grinned, so, initially like Zabuza. The two nodded and replied at the same time, like Zabuza. With that agreement, the shinobi took Tazuna's offer for a much heftier price for the mission. Outside the country. Black cloaks emblazoned with red clouds swayed with the wind as their backs were turned from the country. Two individuals, wearing straw hats covered their faces as the paper-like material dangling at the edge of their headgear swayed along with their cloaks. The only distinguishing feature from the two of them was the triple-bladed scythe that was placed diagonally on the back of one of the men and the other with a rut sack. This has to be the shittiest mission I've had since I've joined this stupid group. I seriously had nothing to offer as a sacrifice for Jashin Sama for this. Why is it even called a mission? This is a fucking fetch quest. The one with the scythe ranted on while the other one, another man with a baritone voice replied to his partner callously. Hedan, quit your whining and shut up. The man with a scythe, now identified as Hedan, replied, Hey, fuck you, Kakuzu. Unlike you, you atheistic rat, I have a dogma to fulfill as a follower of Jashin Sama. A hedonistic fucker like you can never fully understand those of the religious. Religion is merely a congregation of simpletons who simply cannot have the logic to question something that doesn't even exist. You'd behave like me too, if you actually had any brains inside of that hollow head. Kakuzu replied. Blasphemous heathen, that's what you are, Kakuzu. 
Hidan shouted as Kakuzu merely glanced at his partner with an irritated look. Hidan, if you don't shut up, I'm going to pull your head out of your shoulders in the most painful way possible. Bring it, blasphemer, Hidan shouted. Kakuzu then said, don't think that I'm not going to do it too, Hidan. I just went and started up shop that has black pearls in the market and it was pushing my patience just for the organization. Do not piss me off. Kakuzu sighed. Why was he always the one stuck with newbies and idiots? He had set up agents within Nami to have an organized group of taking black pearls and selling them at exorbitant prices to other countries. They were basically smuggling these pearls outside the country and selling them high enough to attract any idiot that would actually buy them. All of the money they earn would be funneled to aim to support the Akatsuki's funding. Kakuzu would have settled for hunting bounties, but even that would be an even bigger problem as they would have no sustainable source of income. They wouldn't know how long Suchi no Kuni would be seeking for their services. So he settled with this little project. On what seemed to be a devolving conversation between him and his partner, Kakuzu had the mind to not get into a fight with his newly recruited teammate. He had killed the last two and their leader was somewhat angered from his actions. If he were to continue such acts, then the leader warned him that he was becoming as much as a nuisance to the organization as a whole. And the leader didn't want dead weights in his little club. Kakuzu soon understood that any more mistakes and it would be his head that will roll figuratively and literally. It didn't occur to the two members of Akatsuki that one of their prime targets had just arrived in Nami no Kuni and they, him and Hidan, had just left the country via the sea route. Two days later, Naruto's group had gone to the festival. All of them were given yukatas and additional accessories to their stay as per Tazuna's generous offering. Many of them refused to depart with most of their dangerous equipment for protection. They knew not to be taken off guard without a weapon at arm's reach should the need arise. It was here that Kiba began noticing his female teammate wasn't around with them much compared to Naruto. He would frequently see Hinata being dragged throughout the festival by Naruto who looked like he was having fun. Much like how Naruto had left Sakura and Sasuke to do their own thing. Shino, is it just me? Or is Hinata spending a little too much time with Naruto all of a sudden? Kiba asked. Shino nodded his head. That would be the case, since the start of this mission, Hinata-san has been spending majority of her time with Naruto-san for a while. Should we be concerned? We most likely shouldn't. I have faith in Naruto-san to respect Hinata-san's wishes. Out of all of us, it is Naruto-san who has shown the most growth after all. Kiba grumbled at that. Why was Naruto so popular all of a sudden? It didn't make sense. The boy was loud and obnoxious, had a way to piss people off without even trying and pranked people on occasion when they were in the academy. Sure, he may have done something that may have been worthy of recognition, the bridge is a testament to that, but this was Uzumaki Naruto. I sense envy and frustration within you, Kiba. I take that you find Naruto-san's sudden rise to a respectable shinobi a baffling phenomenon. Shino asked and Kiba turned his head to his teammate and sighed. Maybe. It's just hard to believe at certain times. Just then, Shino spoke to him with all the wisdom that he could muster for a 12-year-old. Nothing is impossible, Kiba. Shino, you haven't spent enough time with Naruto not to know what he's like. You get what you already see in that guy. He's as transparent as an open book, no more, no less. Kiba remarked. Shino raised an eyebrow at this. And whose fault is it that I don't spend enough time with my comrades? I should also remind you that all creatures create facades to defend themselves. It is to preserve their own health and in consequence, their own survival. There are no exceptions to this rule, not even Naruto-san. I believe the term is coined as, defense mechanisms. What you see is merely a small part of a person. You would be surprised at the subtle hints of understanding that Naruto-san seems so inclined to have. And you notice this, how? Kiba asked his teammate and friend. Shino adjusted his sunglasses and turned back. A shinobi must leave no stone unturned, was Shino's vague answer. Kiba, meanwhile, just decided to leave it at that. Shino had never given him a vague answer, his teammate and friend was always straight to the point and by using one of the rules that the academy had set to him, it made Kiba back off and respect Shino's refusal to answer him well. If Shino didn't want to tell him, then it means that his teammate wanted him to find the answers all on his own. This annoyed Kiba somewhat, but even if he did try to pry in further, Shino would not budge from his disposition. 
Naruto and his team managed to stay for a few more days until the trading negotiations with the merchants were done. The extra work that they had put on driving potential bandits out of Nami no Kuni's doorstep had given their team the additional cash and more reasons for Nami to keep hiring Konoha Shinobi for security reasons in the possible future, has been the reason why Nami no Kuni had more than willingly sealed the deal. It would take another two days for Naruto's team to finally make it back to Konoha at a relaxed face. Naruto had kept smiling as he and his team with the exception of Sasuke, began talking about their wonderful experiences during Nami no Kuni's festival. I wish days like these would last forever. Naruto thought with sentiment as they entered the village through its massive southern gate. He saw his friends go to their own directions one by one while Sasuke vanished in a cloud of smoke. Naruto didn't have the energy left to argue with Sasuke and he had much more important things to do like filling up the mission report along with Shikamaru. For now, his home awaited him. Unknown location. Kakashi looked at the dank stone walls with familiarity of the headquarters for the Anbu. Beside him was Sasuke, sword strapped on his back. Kakashi noted that the boy was confident enough to have hold of the sword, made from a chakra amplifying metal no less. In truth, he knew that Sasuke's training with him was not enough for the boy. Along with the physical and academic skill, comes a certain mental fortitude that should be developed. And none can bring anyone to the brink of mental exhaustion than the Anbu who are trained to endure so much stress and pain in fulfilling the orders of the Hokage. This was what Sasuke needed the most. Kakashi Senpei, what brings you here? Kakashi looked up. A member of the Anbu was looking the same at him while crouching on the ceiling. The Anbu member was wearing the standard clothes and white armor all the while wearing a white porcelain bird mask that seemed durable despite its composition. From what Sasuke could tell, the mask pattern resembled closely to that of a falcon. Ah, falcon, I'm assuming you're the Anbu commander now. Has Tiger left his post? What about rabbit? Kakashi asked, the Anbu member shook his head to all the questions and answered him in a flat tone. I am one of the primary trainers here in the squad. Tiger has not left his post. I surmise that he intends to retire as an Anbu operative unless the Hokage wishes it wouldn't be so. Rabbit is on leave and currently going on a training trip on her own to perfect her fallen lover's sword style. I do not usually engage in small talk, senpei. You asking me questions wastes time, and you should know well not to waste mine with idle talk. Kakashi nodded and gave an apology, forgive me. But I did come here on business. Inside his mask, Falcon was raising an eyebrow. I am assuming that you wish to introduce your student first to a highly classified facility with a purpose. Falcon then pointed to his student flatly while Kakashi nodded. This is it, once I leave this place, Sasuke will be thrown into the wolves' den. He will be pushed to the brink that even I won't be able to control. He will be literally on his own from here on out. He will only appear when the Hokage asks him to and be on team missions where Sasuke will be assigned to. Kakashi then continued to speak as he cleared his throat, I came to you to introduce you to a good potential recruit into Anbu. I hope you can shape him into a shinobi loyal to nothing but the Hokage and Konoha. Silence reigned on the three of them, until the one identified as the trainer spoke in a manner smoother than fine silk. Genin are usually not recommended here, Kakashi-san. Perhaps the time outside has dulled your senses concerning prospective members of Anbu. Kakashi shook his head, no, I made my decision with much deliberation and talks as I could have. He's ready for it. Falcon stood there quietly once more to listen to Kakashi's word about his student being prepared for Anbu. Falcon almost certainly did not feel that venue. Anbu live at the edge of the sword, Kakashi Senpei. No matter what you do, no one is prepared to be gutted like a fish. No one can be prepared to be part of the Anbu. Falcon then gestured for Sasuke to come at his place. The boy followed suit and Sasuke no stood face to face with Falcon. During your stay here, expect to be treated like the lowest of the low. You are a mere trainee, you do not have the right to even be enlisted and wear the masks for your missions or even taking missions at all with an official Anbu directive. You are our sweeper, a cleaner, a substitute. If you wish to be treated fairly, then tough luck, I will decide if you can even lick my sandals. Sasuke merely flinched at those words as Kakashi's back now turned at him while heading out of HQ and giving a casual goodbye. Kakashi would most likely come once more to give a few pointers but needless to say, Sasuke would be trained majority by the ANBU's training officers and he best better prepare himself if he wanted to grow strong. 
After all, they say true strength is measured when your own life is at stake. Root HQ unknown. The light from the candle flickered as Danzo steadied himself and the winds rushed at the topmost bridge while a shinobi appeared behind him, kneeling at him as he turned. You have a mission. I want you to go undercover and monitor the Jinchuriki of the Nine-Tailed Beast. If it becomes a burden or perceived as a threat to the village, then until he is assimilated by the Kyubi, you must take action and neutralize your target or if incapacitated, bring him to our southern bunker. Should anyone bother to ask or notice you, then you will simply be known as Sai. That will be your cover name. Chapter 12. Wilting Flowers. An open field of endless green pastures and gentle breeze as it touched the tall green grass and the leaves of tall trees and rustled them lightly. He could see the grass waving as the wind flowed throughout the air and up above, he could see a near cloudless sky vibrant and blue as his eyes. He looked on in wonder as he saw all around him, the beautiful and calm grasslands as far as the eye can see. It felt so calm, so peaceful and so inviting. As he sat on the ground and looked on in the grasslands that had claimed such beauty even beyond the walls of his village, he had noticed a man sitting beside him, unfamiliar to him staring at the same open fields of endless green pastures. The man gave a slight smile as Naruto looked on in wonder. The man pointed to the furthest tree that he could see standing on top of a small hill and slightly pushed Naruto, as if instructing him to run. His mouth moved but no words escaped his lips but Naruto could read slightly that he should go and run. Not even questioning his instructions, Naruto simply nodded and stood up as he ran at a pace that he was not familiar of. He felt like time was slowing down and his body complied along with it as his mind remained the same. From the endless sea of grass and trees, he ran closer and closer to the tree that the man was pointing at. He could vaguely see a woman there, standing under its shade, her face looking on over the horizon before everything went white. Naruto woke up. He felt his whole body stiff as he stood up. Looking around, he saw his bed on the far side of the room while he was sitting on his wooden chair and on his table. He looked down, and saw the countless scattered pieces of papers that lay atop of his furniture as his mind slowly came back to full force. Oh, right. He had pulled an all-nighter just so he could write the twice-damned mission report that Tsunade had wanted him to write about. Groaning in annoyance, the boy stood up from his chair and stretched his entire body before going to his bathroom to take a shower. He had recalled last night that Shikamaru wanted to meet up with him this morning to see his progress in the mission report. He remembered he had the unfortunate timing of falling asleep in doing his work, but he was sure that he did it right this time. As the bathroom door closed, Kurama stirred. He had sensed a disturbance in the boy's chakra and tried to point out what it was. As the fox's gaze settled on the wet floor of his prison outside his cage and what he saw utterly surprised him. What are you doing inside of this boy? And it was no more as the figure dispersed from the boy's mindscape once more, never letting the fox finish its sentence. This means another upheaval is to happen and this era is about to end. Kurama then turned his sights away from the cage. This boy, truly, he was favored by the gods themselves. Unknown location. Pride was a sin. This was one of the teachings of ancient writings from ages long past, a philosopher's thoughts on the gravest of heinous acts of human nature. Sasuke's mother had taught him that. She had instilled in Sasuke that pride was one of the greatest downfalls of any person. To her, pride was equated to one of its greatest pitfalls, hubris. It was a lesson that taught him that discretion can be a better part of valor. Of course, it was hard to instill something so abstract on a young child's mind. But sometimes, her words did not clearly ring true until Sasuke witnesses it himself. Mostly because many of her lessons in life were a stark contrast to what his father had taught him and what he would wholeheartedly agree. Sons were meant to make their fathers proud and surpass them, after all. To Uchiha Sasuke, pride was something he held with a lion's ferocity. A teaching his father had taught him. No matter the circumstances, he should hold his dignity up high to never be swayed by pretentious thoughts, to always walk forward holding your convictions strong and true, like a warrior would hold a spear. Pride was regal and it was in itself, a prize of achieving and no matter what anyone should say or do to destroy your pride, you should always stand tall with fortitude. Sasuke shakily stood back up as his legs began trembling with exhaustion and fatigue sets in his bones. Pride was set in his very blood, 
The Uchiha were considered one of the strongest and most powerful clans of Konoha and he was proud of being a part of such an honored clan and join in its laurels of prominence throughout the shinobi world. Indeed, even he wouldn't be letting go of his pride anytime soon. But after commencing his training by the Anbu, after being shoved to the dirt and eating mud numerous times, Sasuke knew now that pride meant absolutely nothing to them and their work all served a purpose that had nothing to do with clan traditions and more about tangible choices that mattered to them the most. It was the safety of their home and who represented them made it their sole purpose to fight. Sasuke could not understand why such undying loyalty could even exist. Sasuke climbed, limping as he thus began to make his way to a cliff with his chakra with no help from his legs. Beside him, a man with an anbu mask, Falcon, watched him and threw countless insults and expletives with not much else. Just because a former anbu officer and my superior recommended you for this institution does not mean you're hot shit, you little ankle biter. You are nothing. Your clan is nothing now but mere fertilizer which insects use as a source of food. You do not have what it takes to be part of anbu, quit now while you're still alive you little cretin. Among the many insults and put-downs that the man had thrown at him, Sasuke had learned the hard way not to lash out against him. If he were to give the man a simple angry glare, then Falcon would utterly beat his face into an almost unrecognizable degree. That was how hard he was on his trainees. Because of it, Sasuke slowly began to learn how to take punishment to the worst degree possible. Falcon was not only physically dominant and sadistic, he also knew how to heal a person and Falcon would smack him again to repeat the process all over until he was satisfied. And the man would do it in ways that utterly destroyed one's dignity for every one of the Anbu members to see. This was not only physical torture, it was also mentally destructive to recruits as well. Over the course of a whole week, five of the fifteen hopeful candidates dropped out of the program entirely and they never looked back. Sasuke noted that they were seasoned shunin who thought being part of Anbu would further their careers. But they came and went. They couldn't handle Falcon's training methods. Mentally punishing his recruits almost seemed like a game to the sadistic man. Perhaps Ibiki was his closest friend. You are trash if you think a genin like you could enter Anbu, why don't you just quit while you're on ahead? Shinobi exist for their village, and your motives, while understandable, must never come first before serving your village. Do not jeopardize the safety of your home. You are a shinobi of Konoha before you are Uchiha Sasuke. Sasuke slid down from the cliff wall as his body was scratched by the jagged rocks and injuring him enough that he flinched from the pain. Falcon continued to deride him with remarks that would make his blood boil, but he couldn't do anything about it. He wasn't strong enough to even touch the man's face. He was starting to think that Kakashi had been far too lenient on him. Yakaniku Q. Naruto. For the last time, making a mission report and writing on your diary are two different things. Shikamaru chastised the blonde in front of him with the boy's face on top of their table all the while papers were littered all across the table. The blonde had tears streaming down his face comically as he mumbled, and I spent all night on writing about that damned mission report. For days now, Naruto and Shikamaru had been deployed in several missions all across the village in helping with the finishing touches of rebuilding their home. The trip to Nami no Kuni had been a boon for the village and the Hokage expected a report coming from the duo about the sudden surge of good trade coming from Wave. Unfortunately, Naruto wrote it so informally that giving the mission report would just scratch the heads of state from both their village and the daimyo who seemed all too pleased with recovering many of their monetary losses so fast. Shikamaru foresaw this and had offered to help Naruto in writing the damn paperwork but he didn't foresee that Naruto was completely helpless in writing up a professional report to the Hokage. He was sure if the Godime read Naruto's report then she would either bop Naruto's head in for sheer stupidity or laugh her ass off at the display of such crude writing. He knew the blonde wasn't exactly the brightest bulb in the house but this was ridiculous. Shikamaru of course, thought the whole thing was a troublesome ordeal to begin with. If it wasn't even required, he wouldn't even bother with it and just leave it as it is. Tsunade had given them a week and today was the deadline. Thinking of the whole thing brought a headache on him and he wished that this wouldn't be the case for many more years to come. You have a session with Jiraiya-sama and Aruka-sensei later this noon, right? I suggest you pick up the slack and get to writing. Naruto growled in frustration. How the hell should I go through this, Shikamaru? Why the fuck do we have to write this down? His fellow Chunin could only give a sigh. Look, 
let's go through the motions here one more time. This time, I'm going to look at your writing letter by letter. Against his lazy nature, Shikamaru decided to watch Naruto's mission log. It would be another hour before Naruto could finish with Shikamaru finally approving of what he just did. Thanking whatever gods out there, Naruto stretched his arms upwards when he stood up and asked Shikamaru, by the way, how long will Ba-chan open up the talk for that peer recommendations? It's not like it's going to be open forever and do we already have a candidate? Shikamaru's lips merely gave hum and thought deeply about it for a few seconds before finally answering the blonde. I have a candidate in mind, but I'd like to go over to Asuma sensei and ask for his thoughts on him. Apparently, his sensei has been pushing for us to promote him. At first, I thought it was the teacher's bias and he doesn't really fit the bill but the mission to wave clearly made it a sound choice for me. What about you? We can't really give a recommendation unless both of us agree unanimously. Naruto shrugged, I think I know who you're talking about. I was going to recommend Sasuke but I don't think he's ready. He's changed a little, that's for sure, but I still can't get over the fact about what he did during the invasion. You mean when he ran off on his own without asking for backup? Yeah, don't remind me. I don't think I can live with that much excitement for very long. He certainly has the skills to become a chunin, but he lacks foresight in many ways. He has Shino's realism, Neji's aptitude and Lee's skill. Don't get me wrong, he's good at what he does, but chunin material. Probably not in the slightest, the only one to fit the bill here is Shino, he's just unlucky he couldn't get to show his skills during the exam, but his performance during the invasion is a big plus. Naruto nodded at that, yeah, I heard about that. He gave Ino his pack to give her a fighting chance against Konkuro too, right? Shikamaru nodded as well, it's a good strategy. What Shino didn't expect was Ino diving and risking her life to get a hit in. Shino gave a sound decision but Ino gave a confounding result. I'll run by this with Kakashi sensei when he's alone. I don't think Sasuke would take it kindly when he wasn't what we had in mind. Naruto answered as he gave his goodbyes to Shikamaru. The Nara heir looked down on the papers and went to grab his glass to drink only to notice a small crack in it. The boy scowled. Superstitions aren't my thing. But whatever this is, I just hope it's merely a coincidence. Shikamaru decided to ignore such ominous thoughts and decided to compile all the written reports that he and Naruto had done since the past week and went for the mission office. It was midday when Naruto had finally met up with Jiraiya who was waiting in the training grounds with arms crossed and under the shade of a tree. When the man saw Naruto, Jiraiya nodded and once more began his lesson to the blonde about applying his elemental nature to his weapons. It took two hours for Naruto to practice with his newfound arsenal as well as another full two hours with practicing the Bunshin Debakua, Great Clone Explosion. By the time the training session ended, Naruto had finally gotten the jutsu down and was now successfully resting on the grassy floor as Jiraiya had told him to take a rest before heading out. By this time, Jiraiya began lecturing him once more on wind chakra natures in order to drill it in Naruto's head. A question had popped up in Naruto's head and asked the toad sage while raising his hand. Hey, Aero Senen, my teammates are learning a taijutsu and kenjutsu style that isn't like the one in the academy. Do you think I should learn one too? The man looked at his apprentice with a raised eyebrow and replied to the boy with an amused smirk. A specific style of fighting doesn't suit you, brat. You're a learner by doing just like the yandaimi. In order to learn a specific taijutsu style, that would imply you actually have discipline to begin with and I don't mean just the diligence to continue learning it, but also your body having to acclimate to a taijutsu that's not what it's made for because of multiple reasons. To this, Naruto frowned and gave a sigh. The old pervert simply didn't care and continued on. Take Lee for example, he has the physique to learn the Gokan from Gai and he equally works as hard to have that physique. His body was made for explosive short bursts of power and complementary to that, his speed. You, on the other hand, are more reliant on what your senses can perceive and react accordingly not only that, but putting you in a particular style would be too orthodox and your body would not adapt well in certain situations where it's more applicable to be thinking ahead because you are not made for that just like the fourth Hokage was. I admit, skill and speed are important factors in a fight, but tell me, did Lee ever have a chance against Gara in his fight in the preliminaries? You're delusional if you think he had a chance. And perhaps Jiraiya spoke the truth. Battles were unpredictable yet at the same time, 
have certain probabilities in certain situations. Naruto knows that his sensei wasn't trying to knock off Lee for his failure, but sometimes realism has to happen at some point. Recalling the battle, he couldn't help but feel that Jiraiya was somewhat right. If two ninjas who had the same amount of speed, skill and power were to meet in battle, then the victor goes to the ninja who could outthink his opponent. So broadening your bases, it all depends on you to maintain a certain level of physique but due to your status as a container, you are naturally inclined to have an even better physical position that most people likely could ever dream of. Taijutsu is just that, engaging your opponent in close combat, at its very core, it only teaches you how to take down opponents in a more sophisticated manner. It's thinking on your feet more and less K to practice and execution because who'd be stupid enough to let their opponent get into a particular stance if they have a chance to force them out of it. That's the problem with main taijutsu users, once they are forced to a fight that's not within their realm then they are pretty much crippled that's why I'm not particular to any style unless it can complement your preferred skill set. The only exception to this rule so far as I have seen, is Lee's sensei, Guy, and maybe Tsunade and the current Rakage. To this, Jiraiya grabbed a scroll and began writing down on it once he sat down in front of the blonde. Having good taijutsu is a fundamentally sound idea especially for your cage bunshin, though. But don't you think you have already created a style based on that technique, anyway? Naruto began to think, well, if I had a better style, maybe it'll be better overall and overwhelm my opponents much easier. Something like Lee's would be good. Jiraiya shook his head, specific taijutsu styles cater to specific people. The Goken, despite its impressive display of power and speed, is mostly used on a single opponent. It creates openings by powering through defenses and angulating attacks to slip through their guards. And while that's all well and good, you don't exactly strike me as someone who would stick to this style when the going gets tough. So what do you think would make me a better fighter? Naruto asked now scratching his head as he looked up and began thinking. He knew he was nearing his limitations in options in close-range combat. He needed something to offset that. Experience, brat, and lots of it, fighters become better when they obtain experience. A highly trained soldier, if he is relatively new, still stands no chance against an unskilled war veteran who knows the tricks of the trade. Besides, I already have something in mind for you to learn once you're ready. For now, the only thing that you can do is to increase your physique mainly your speed, and your skill. You'll eventually learn that those three basic foundations are all that you need in a close range battle. You already have that creativity of yours and you have your experience when fighting me, granted you're still a bean sprout compared to me, but it would take a while until you can match my greatness. Jiraiya mentioned that last sentence and puffed his chest with pride, Naruto meanwhile, looked on at Jiraiya with a flat affect. Yeah, well. You're still Aero Senen. Jiraiya had a tick mark appearing at the back of his head as his right upper lip twitched at the insult, one of these days brat, one of these days and you won't be saying that when you hit puberty. In fact you'll thank me later. Somehow, Jiraiya couldn't help but feel he had just cursed himself against Kashina's grave. You're still single. Naruto had cut in. Jiraiya's teeth grinded at the thought of Naruto still reminding him of that fact even though the brat was still single too. He was a 50-year-old unmarried man, for goodness sake. Naruto still had the last laugh. Turning down, Jiraiya just gave a huff and focused on the seal he had been working on in the scroll. He had just gotten to about half of the writing in creating another storage scroll to deliver a message to one of his many contacts around the continent about his plans for the next two months. The man scratched the back of his head as he looked down ultimately forgetting some parts of his writing on the scroll as he scratched the back of his head in order to think about what he was supposed to add again. Naruto looked over his shoulder when he saw Jiraiya was scratching his head and saw the old man writing down runic words onto the scroll. He had recognized this as a seal of sorts and his eyebrows were raised in curiosity. The toad sage glanced over his right shoulder and saw Naruto looking at his work and smirked. You have a curiosity for Fuinjutsu, brat. The blonde gave a single nod for his answer. In truth, he had been interested in Fuinjutsu before because he had heard his hero, the Yandaimi Hokage, had been great with seals and he wanted to emulate his idol so badly. Unfortunately, the books were strictly off-limits for him at the time and he decided to put it on the backburner until he became a ninja. Unfortunately, he had mostly forgotten about it until his teacher decided to write a seal formula on the spot and in front of him. 
His interest renewed, he decided to sneak a glance at his teacher at work who was writing in a brisk pace at the art of sealing. The old man smirked once more and handed the scroll to him, a bottle of ink and a pen to the boy. One of the requirements for the sealing arts was a pretty deep skill in brush strokes and calligraphy. Perhaps this would be a good time for Naruto to start as early on in his plans for training. He had forgotten the formula already so the scroll was a dud at this point and it would be a waste to throw it away just like that. When Naruto was given the items from his teacher's hands, the boy immediately began thinking deep as he gave a low hum before he wrote something on the paper. Jiraiya watched in slight amusement as the boy wrote with the grace of a rampaging ox on the sheet of paper. He couldn't help but laugh at Naruto's forceful writing as he continued to jot down on the scroll. Little did Jiraiya know that Naruto was actually writing the sequence of seals that he saw in his exploding notes thinking that it would mostly be okay when he heard Jiraiya mumble about it being useless now. When Naruto noticed the man snicker, the boy scowled and decided to throw the scroll away because of Jiraiya's attitude. It was then that they felt a little bit of chakra left from Naruto's hands and was absorbed by the paper before it was thrown. The ceiling matrix grew unstable, and Jiraiya's eyes widened. He quickly ran for Naruto, grabbed him by the waist and jumped as far as he could when he saw the scroll glow bright and suddenly exploding in a matter of seconds and taking with it, a sizable chunk of earth in the training field as well as a few uprooted trees here and there. Boom. A pale-faced Jiraiya could make out the small mushroom cloud making its way upwards to the skies as his jaw dropped in utter shock. A bit of color returned to him when he turned his gaze to the blonde who looked on in wonder. It was supposed to be a dud. Jiraiya should have known to always keep his wits about him when he was around Naruto's vicinity. Tsunade would probably have his hide for this. A few hours later at the Hokage Tower. The good news is the intelligence division's paranoia is dwindling down. Sage knows how those basement dwellers are getting by with their tinfoil hats on most of the time. Tsunade commented as she put down her papers and looked angrily at Jiraiya. Jiraiya had a distinct feeling that he didn't want to ask what was coming next, but curiosity won first and decided to ask Tsunade, hesitant of course, of his actions, what's the bad news? Tsunade's angry look turned into a sadistic sneer, oh, there is no bad news. Jiraiya knew that something was coming up. Yet. The man was sweating bullets. Do you mind telling me why you and your stupid apprentice decided to send one of my training grounds into the atmosphere? Jiraiya twitched. Would you believe me that Naruto accidentally set off a dud seal and turned it into a raging inferno that almost swallowed us whole? Tsunade raised her eyebrows at this, I want details. Needless to say, Jiraiya wasn't getting off the hook anytime soon. While Jiraiya was being grilled and trying his damnedest to avoid getting sent to the same place where one of the village's training grounds was now, Naruto had met up with Aruka just a few minutes after class was dismissed. He had bumped into Konohamaru along the way that was making a mad dash away and screaming about training followed by his friends and lackeys, Moegi and Udon. He had also bumped into a Hayuga who was merely walking towards what was supposedly the Hayuga compound. The girl looked a lot like Hanada minus the blue hair and replaced with straight long black hair that reached to her back. As Naruto went past her, he heard the girl whisper to herself. Uzumaki Naruto. And while Naruto at least knew he was quite infamous around the village, this did leave a puzzled look at the boy as he turned back only to see the girl heading home straight away and not looking back at him. Deciding it was of no consequence, the boy shrugged and turned back towards the academy as Aruka finally got out of the building. Got something on your mind, Naruto. Aruka asked with a smile and Naruto returned the smile with one of his own and gave a nod. Just a few. It took Aruka by surprise earlier in the morning when Naruto had come to ask for his help on something. Aruka didn't know what it was, there were a few things he could do now for Naruto than there ever was all those years ago. This Naruto now was independent, a rambunctious and problematic boy budding and turning into a reliable man. He was growing and even if the specks of maturity are slow, it was there and it was advancing. Aruka knew that clothes didn't make a man, but Naruto was fitting in with his role slowly now. If Aruka was Naruto's real father, he'd be so proud of the boy right now, but even if he wasn't, he would be and he still is to this day. Raising Naruto had been difficult. He took a lot of attention and needed to be supervised for him not to cause trouble all those years ago. He might not have the boy, a certain mistake on his part. Aruka regretted, but as a consolation for thought, things have at least turned out for the best. Hey, 
Aruka sensei, what do you think about Hinata? Naruto asked to him, looking genuinely curious and somewhat confused as Aruka looked at him oddly. Why are you asking me all of a sudden? Aruka asked, and he noticed the boy looking away for the briefest of seconds before turning his gaze back at his father figure and friend and then looking down with a sullen expression. I I don't know exactly. Naruto gave an honest reply. He was truly confused, he had never asked for Aruka's opinion regarding other people. This was new to him, and it felt like he was walking in a completely different land all of a sudden. Inwardly, Aruka gave a smile and thought that this too, was part of growing up. Well, Hanada was a very shy girl when she first entered school. Aruka started and Naruto leaned closer to listen to his teacher. Aruka noted this that Naruto's posture indicated that he was very interested. She was very meek, nervous and almost always quiet whenever I saw her. But she was polite and considerate of other people from what I can tell. She does well in her academics but when we were applying theory, she just falls short. Aruka stated. Naruto looked bewildered at this and asked his former teacher. But why? Hanada's really strong, she should be able to face almost anyone and her taijutsu is pretty wicked. Aruka merely shook his head, well, that's because she has a lot of confidence issues. She's nervous, shy and if we asked for her to do something on her practical tests, she would doubt herself and stumble. They then turned to a corner and headed out to Ichiraku. I tried to get her out of her shell, to remove the doubt on her own abilities, I really did, but I couldn't do it well. Not when it was her own home that truly pushed her down to the brink of self-loathing. The damage done to her self-confidence was, very deep. Aruka tried to put it lightly but Naruto's expression still showed a face of disgust to the ones responsible for her problems. That is, until she saw a certain person doing his best. Aruka said and he grinned at Naruto. The blonde then quizzically pointed to himself as if he was asking if he was the one Aruka was talking about. Aruka gave a tiny chuckle and replied, yes, Naruto. When Hinata first saw you, she began practicing a lot longer, stayed longer in school and read a lot too. Like you, she also began working hard and her marks improved. Unfortunately, her confidence was still low. Nothing I do could remove the doubt she had within herself. I knew she needed something, but I couldn't help her. I wasn't the one that she needed to keep herself up. To this, Aruka frowned. What she needed too was the same thing that you wanted. She wanted someone to acknowledge her, to make her feel wanted, to make her feel that she was somebody. In that sense, she was a lot like you. She still probably is even to this day. Aruka nodded, and try as I might, I could never truly help her. The one who she craved that attention was her own father and one other person. Naruto flinched, it was me, right? Aruka grinned, that you are, Naruto. I couldn't exactly fault you, though. You were pinning for Sakura after all these years. Just what happened when you said you were over her? Naruto gave a sigh as he looked away, Aruka sensei, when people call me dumb. Sometimes, I can't deny their words. I really am. But even someone like me can tell that I can't win against Sasuke with Sakura-chan. I've known it for so long but then, one day it just disappeared. I became Chunin, I finally beat Sasuke at something and suddenly, winning over Sakura wasn't worth it anymore. I've accomplished something, but I know I can never win over Sakura and beat Sasuke there. I hate losing, but then again, I won something that even that bastard hasn't even touched yet and will never beat my record because of it. I know, really stupid and probably petty too, but damn it if I didn't say I wouldn't like to gloat about it. Aruka chuckled. All right then, what started this thing with Hanada? Another sigh escaped the boy's lips, that's just it, Aruka sensei, I I don't know what. One day, she found out my deepest, darkest secret about you know what and she confronted me about it and said she was okay with it and saying that she still wants to be my friend and. Aruka had to raise his hands up at the boy to slow him down. Whoa, 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 slow down, Naruto. What's this about Hinata knowing about? Aruka leaned in closer and whispered on the blonde's ears. The Kayubi, Naruto looked sideways and smiled, seeing the sunset and blanket the land of fire in a comforting hue of orange and yellow. She found out during the invasion when we went off to fight Gara. I can't remember the exact details as to how, but her words struck me hard in a good way, though. Aruka sighed, okay, I get it. Then, what did she say? That even though she knew about it, she was okay with it, 
she still wanted to be friends and that fact alone couldn't be enough to make her think any less. Aruka smiled when Naruto said those words with a smile of his own. Aruka could tell Naruto was truly happy with those words. For someone to say those words to Naruto, it must have felt so strong to have reached him. The teacher gave a knowing nod, taking solace in the fact that Hinata was not shallow enough for such things and that she was still willing to be friends with Naruto. So why did you want to talk about her? He finally asked. Naruto, for the first time in their conversation, blushed. Naruto didn't notice it for a few seconds but they had finally made it to Ichiraku Ramen and the father-daughter duo noticed Naruto blushing and looking away as Aruka was asking him with a smile. The blonde mumbled about something. What's that, my boy? What did you say? Chuki asked. So caught up with his own embarrassment and thoughts, he shouted it out loud inside the shop. I said would she like it if I asked her out for a date. Chuki looked at Ayame and Ayame looked back at her father before leaning in closer to the boy. Oh, really? And who would Uzumaki Naruto ask out on a date, then, hmm? Chuki asked leaning in closer to the blonde as Aruka laughed out loud and Ayame squealed and moved as fast as lightning when she leaned on the counter even the Yandaimi would be embarrassed. Who are you going to ask out, Naruto? Naruto finally snapped out of his thoughts when he saw Chuki and Ayame leaning towards him with the intent to extract every bit of gossip from him as soon as possible. Ah, shit. Naruto wanted to hit his head on the counter for his own stupidity about this particular mess. Why are you asking me then, Naruto? Wouldn't it be appropriate to ask Hinata about that question? Aruka asked as he was trying to guide Naruto to sort his feelings out. Now he understood why Naruto came to him. Naruto looked up to him as an adult parental figure that knew more about life and consequentially, women, more than anybody the boy knew. Naruto would not simply ask his other two senseis because he probably thought that his former teacher in the academy had to be the most sensible of the three. Jiraiya would probably lecture him about the more raunchy side of relationships while Kakashi would simply give the boy a copy of his favorite books which, unbelievably enough, came from Jiraiya and would likely result in Jiraiya once more guiding the boy to manhood by proxy of his own book. Uruka thanked the heavens above that it was him that Naruto consulted first. He didn't know what would happen if Jiraiya or Kakashi were the ones to give him advice. I came to ask you because I'm confused about this whole thing. It's hard trying to understand about your feelings on your first love. Ayame had cut in and Chuki gave a sagely nod as he prepared the meals of the two when they ordered. Uruka looked at his former student in a form of understanding. Naruto never grew up surrounded by love. It was a tragic thing for a boy to look on in longing seeing other children having such a wonderful time with their parents while he tries to live on his own. Naruto understood familial love and even platonic affections. But the boy had never even once quite understood romantic love. Being so caught up with other things, Uruka could tell that Naruto starved for something that made him complete. It was probably why the boy was restless. And now an opportunity had shown itself in the most surprising way possible. Naruto didn't know what to do with it. To the boy, things were moving too fast for him. You're not sure yet, are you, Naruto? Ayame asked and Naruto gave a wordless nod. She grinned and put her hands on her sides, then why not do it? Naruto looked at Ayame dumbfounded, do what? Ayame, Chuki and Aruka all rolled their eyes and said at the same time, ask her out, of course. You see, Naruto, like any job. You have to experience to know a lot things. It's like how I make my ramen. You won't get anything done if you don't do something about it. Naruto gave a sigh as he put his head on the counter, I know that but. Ayame sighed. Okay mister, how about this, why don't we talk about Hinata first then we can make sure if you really want to ask her out or not. Better yet, if she would even accept you or not. Naruto flinched when he heard the word, reject. Somehow. The prospect of being rejected slightly hurt. Let's start with how you interact with her and how long. Naruto groaned. He then turned to the old ramen chef, old man Chuki, is our order up yet? The old man grinned, not until we finish this, boy. You get to eat until we can sort you out, it's for your own good. Forced to comply with his interrogators, Naruto did as what he was told and told them every interaction he has had with Hinata so far. As he told the tales that came from his memories, he never noticed that he was smiling along. He felt somewhat happy that he was sharing these stories with the father-daughter duo and Aruka. It felt relieving to say the least. 
She sounds kind and considerate. I think you should really go for it, Naruto. Ayame replied as she put into consideration that the girl liked Naruto as well, perhaps more than what Naruto could currently give. That I agree on, at least. If she's like that then she's a good catch, Naruto. Who knows, your first love might be the one, as rare as it is. Chuki remarked. This is the Hyuga clan, though. Not something Naruto could just casually stroll in and ask for the hand of the Hyuga heiress to court. Uruka warned. Chuki and Ayame simply scoffed at it with Chuki being more vocal. Bah, strip them off of their power and you have just another clan with weird traditions. Maybe we commoners will never understand them, but we know we understand love better than those fools. Chuki commented earning a laugh from Aruka. Right you are, Chuki-san. But we should approach this in a discreet manner. We can't have Hiyashi-sama scour the entire village shouting at Naruto with sword in hand. Naruto paled at the thought. So what do you propose then, Aruka-san? Ayame asked genuinely curious. Let's try to discuss this some other time, shall we? Now that Naruto is finally willing to ask Hanat out, we should let the boy rest his nerves. At least he's comfortable about it, no. Uruka suggested, trying to ease his favorite student as the boy finally let out a sigh of relief as he dug into his favorite food. A few more minutes of chatting and laughing later, Naruto and Uruka left the small shop. They both noticed it was night time already and both decided to go to their homes, but not before Naruto had asked Uruka. Uruka sensei, do you think she'll like it? Asking her out, I mean. Naruto asked one last time as she looked up into the star-laden sky. Naruto, I'm sure whatever happens, it will be for the best. We won't know, only Hanada can tell you her answer. Naruto gave a nod and left. Uruka, however, bit his lower lip for telling a white lie. He knew for a fact that Hanada has had a long time crush on Naruto since their days in the academy. He was observant like that and could tell that Hanada had her heart meant for Naruto. But he couldn't say anything about Hanada's feelings, part of growing up was to say what you mean and be confident in it. Hanada needed to say her feelings just as much as Naruto needs to understand them. It wasn't his place to keep intervening for Naruto and Hanada. If he did, then they would never truly grow up. When Naruto made it to his apartment, with the most comfortable feeling ever, he prompted to get an early sleep in. As he entered the room, however, he was met with a pair of Sharingan eyes. You have run out of places to hide, Naruto-kun. And with those words, Naruto's world went black. Morning came and the sun's rays touched the surface of the land as it reached out over into the mountainous areas of Kanahagakur no Sato. In particular, the Hokage Tower was early in the working hours as Tsunade began piling the paperwork that she would be doing today. She had opted to check the medical charts first and nodded with pride as Lee's operation went successful with the boy on his way to make a full recovery. The medics that had helped her were great assets to her and they had entertained her, a government-based institution solely for the development and training for medic nin in advanced studies. The idea was too good to pass up and she had been contemplating on it ever since. After she was done, she had opted to take a break off of reading medical charts and began to flip open the newspaper. Her eyes turned to pinpricks as her heart suddenly began beating faster and adrenaline began pumping in her veins. Shizun, get me Jiraiya at once. She had left the stack of newspapers sprawled on the floor as the front page displayed a winning number combination at the lottery and a ticket with the same combination along with it. Sakura went up the stairs of Naruto's apartment complex at once as she had been tasked by Kakashi to wake the boy up. It was already 8 in the morning and like the many habits that Kakashi had been trying to curb, Naruto had been late to his promised time of training with them. Worried that something might be up, Kakashi had asked Sakura to retrieve Naruto in his apartment while he goes to Anbu headquarters to check on Sasuke. This was supposed to be training day for the entirety of Team 7 as well as a mission. Even though Naruto was promoted to Chunin, he was still part of Team 7. It had irked Sakura that she was forced to wake Naruto up in his apartment and reasoned out this was more time wasted in training. She knocked on the door of her teammate three times but no response came. Once more, she knocked three times and no response came. Annoyed that the blonde might still be sleeping in, Sakura opted to shout. Naruto, get the hell up, we have training and a mission. Still no response came. Sakura growled in frustration as she reached for the doorknob and found it unlocked. 
Sakura had raised her eyebrows right then and there as her senses became increasingly alarmed. She slid the door open and drew her twin double-edged swords and slowly walked in finding nothing but a clean apartment with ramen cups on the table and an open window. She turned around, alert of what might have happened when Kakashi had suddenly appeared from the room's window. The man looked grim as he went inside and began rummaging through Naruto's things. No signs of a struggle, but his things are still here, what are you telling me? Kakashi asked to himself as Sakura looked on worriedly. Sensei. What is? Deciding that he had no time to answer Sakura's questions, Kakashi cut his thumb with a kanai and slammed his hand on the wooden floor. Kuchio's no jutsu, summoning technique. Smoke littered the small apartment and dispersed in the air. From the summoning circle, out came a familiar looking dog. Pakum, can you tell me who was in here last night? The dog nodded and sniffed the area for a few seconds and replied, Naruto was here last night, but there was another scent here, it's the same as Sasuke's but at the same time, different. Kakashi's eyes widened. Sensei. Sakura. I want you to grab your gear back at your home and prepare for a mission outside the village. Naruto has been kidnapped. Sakura stood there shocked as Kakashi left. Her mind couldn't even register a question as to why but she felt her knees buckle slightly in weakness as she leaned by the wall opposite the door. It was then that Sasuke had appeared by the door as he ran up to Sakura. What happened? Kakashi asked that I should be relieved for the day because of a possible mission. S. Sasuke-kun. Naruto has. Sasuke's features darkened. The idiot has what? Sakura. Naruto has been kidnapped. The sound of multiple footsteps soon reached their ears as tens of ninjas began running out of the village as they were deployed. The village is on high alert. All civilians return to your homes now and stay indoors. By this time, Sakura snapped out of her shock and jumped out of the window as she made a mad dash at her home. Sasuke turned back, looked around Naruto's room and noticed a crack on the photo frame of Team 7, with Naruto's face being the center of it. Sasuke scowled and went out of the room. The sound of dripping was all he could hear, all that he could feel. Naruto was in a dreamless sleep but his mind was conscious yet his body has yet to react. The surrounding darkness made it hard for him to see. He could still feel his breath but he could neither see nor hear anything that wasn't dripping. Wake up, brat. A sudden flux of chakra brought him out of his catatonia and he shook his head as he looked around. Karama. What happened? No time. Just use mold your chakra and I'll push you out of here with mine, do it now. Once you go outside, perform the cage bunshin and the kawarimi. Run as fast as you can. Naruto frowned at this, why? Just do it, brat. Or do you want to die? The fox growled after he said this. Naruto, alarmed by this change in behavior within the fox, quickly complied. I don't know what's going but, when Naruto flared his chakra, he suddenly felt the push of Kurama's chakra towards him as he sailed past into the dark halls of his consciousness. His eyes snapped open and he could now clearly see. He was being carried over by a tall, hulking large blue-skinned man with a giant sword strapped on his back. Naruto suddenly performed the cage bunshin without warning earning a surprise from the two missing ninja. Itachi-san, I thought you said he would be knocked out for at least two days. The tall man remarked as Naruto was quick to perform a kawarimi and switched with one of his clones before Kisame could react. It seems as if the Kyubi's chakra is more potent and serious than we thought. That or something else in his chakra weakened my genjutsu. Itachi remarked. As twenty clones jumped, Kisame was about to swing Samahata when the clones suddenly began exploding all around. The smoke cleared as the debris and soot subsided, a wall of water encircling Kisame and Itachi was in the middle of the explosions. Kisame sported a vicious smile and gave an amused chuckle. He knows your technique, Itachi-san. The wall of water dropped and out in the distance, Itachi could tell the remaining traces of chakra that littered the atmosphere. He wouldn't be able to get far. Itachi mentioned and quickly began performing several hand seals and leaned back taking an enormous amount of air and exhaling fire from his mouth. Kaden. Gukakyo no Jutsu, Fire Release, Grand Fireball Technique. A giant ball of flame surged through the air at an incredible rate. It whizzed by in the air quick and burned off anything in its wake. Naruto looked back and saw the giant ball of fire heading to him quick. The blonde gritted his teeth and tried to perform the Shunshin no Jutsu once more, but found himself too late as he was engulfed in a massive surge of flames. A little something to help cool things off, 
Kisame then began performing his own set of hand seals and smirked once he stretched out his right hand. Sweden. Sukoden no Jutsu, Water Release, Water Shark Bullet Technique. A surge of water in the shape of a giant shark surged forward and slammed onto the area where the fireball exploded and violently splashed in it. From the water, Naruto jumped through the shark projectile and the explosion of water helped cool off some of the temperature around him. He flinched as he looked at his left arm, it was burned badly. Naruto had to cut off his sleeve there due to it burning from Itachi's technique. He performed the Shunshin no Jutsu once more and was utterly horrified when Itachi and Kisame were keeping up with him without a problem. Surprised by our technique, boy. The Shunshin no Jutsu isn't exactly a godsend of a technique nor is it the best getaway one. Kisame replied with a chuckle, Samahata drawn from his back and rested on the man's shoulders. Itachi drew a kunai from his sleeve and quickly shoots it at the blonde, Naruto was quick to deflect and letting his experience guide him but Itachi was quick to retaliate and shot two more kunai this time in quick succession, deflecting the first kunai to gain stability above and pointing down and then the last kunai hitting the bottom of the first knife and headed straight down to the blonde. Gah! Naruto shouted as the kunai fell on his back, embedding itself and making Naruto wince in pain as he dropped into the forest floor and slid on the ground as he got up. Kisame gave a sinister and amused laugh. Resistance is futile, Itachi merely said, as he threw a set of shuriken at Naruto in blinding and quick accuracy. The boy had no choice but to quickly pull out the kunai protruding at his lower back and run as fast as he could. The shuriken embedded hard on the ground while two nicked him at the side of his face but Naruto didn't have a chance to look back as Kisame appeared before him. You know, I could never agree with Itachi-san in taking you cleanly. Our methods are, different concerning our mission, you see. Whereas Itachi-san would do things subtly, I tend to play with my targets for a little while longer. The man said with a sneer as Naruto was suddenly kicked in the stomach. Naruto had the air kicked out of him as he rolled back from Kisame feeling the man's thunderous foot slam up to his abdomen. He could feel Kurama's chakra working on overdrive to dry and heal some of the damage left behind by these two fearsome shinobi as Kisame went through several hand seals while Naruto began pumping chakra to his hands. We'll have none of that. Itachi had suddenly cut in as Naruto felt the back of his neck being pulled by the collar as he was slammed on the ground by Sasuke's older brother. Naruto gasped in as the air escaped his lungs once more and blood was now seeping from his mouth. Itachi was about to make eye contact when Naruto had performed a timely Kawarimi substitution with a nearby log. Itachi escaped quickly enough as the log was laden with explosive notes. The piece of lumber gave an angry hiss as Itachi had quickly performed a timely jump from the explosion that took place as the blonde was then quickly dispatched by another Itachi hiding from the trees. Naruto fell down from the treetops again, as the Itachi that had slammed him down on the ground disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Cage Bunshin, goddamn it! Naruto inwardly cursed as he tried to come up with an escape route. His thoughts stopped when he heard a sinister chuckle escape the air. He turned around with the blue-skinned giant of a man sneering at him. Do try to survive this if you can Jinchuriki-san. Kisame then held out his right hand once more but shouted the name of a different technique this time. Naruto. Sweden. Sushoha water release. Water colliding wave. Then, a gush of water escaped from his hands and Naruto was sent hurtling away from them. The water raged violently against the sea of trees and Naruto was swept by it. He could gain footing could not escape and by the looks of things, these two didn't even look like they were having a hard time with him. Then he felt an unimaginable amount of pain surge its way through his legs. He looked down and he found out that his leg was broken as it collided with a tree very hard. Kurama, I need your chakra. The boy asked, the fox didn't have to be asked twice and flooded Naruto's system with his own chakra. Red began seeping through with the blue as Naruto began to draw out more and more of the Kyuubi's energy. His eyes turned from deep blue to blood red, his pupils turning to slits and his birthmarks began to spread throughout his cheeks as his hair turned much more pronounced. His broken leg mended itself instantly as bone reconnected to bone and cartilage began forming once again. I can't die here, he mumbled to himself as the red chakra flooded into his system and burned into his veins like liquid fire. The rush of Kurama's chakra made him lose himself as he growled and shook the earth beneath his feet finally decided to use it, huh. But no matter, Samahata is getting hungry anyway. 
Kisame grinned and he could feel his sword grumbling in hunger when he felt such a powerful and dense chakra escape near its vicinity. Red chakra began to coalesce, taking shape around the boy, a long red tail made of chakra escaped just behind him and two long ears made of the same energy formed on his head. Chakra sizzled and bubbled all around Naruto as he leaned down and went on all fours. The inner beast within the boy reared its head and glared at Kisame with a growl. The boy charged at the man as Kisame prepared his sword. Kisame's grin widened when the boy began forming a round shell of chakra in his right hand. Kisame could see the wisps of chakra encircling inside going faster and faster as the boy charged at him. Naruto roared and slammed the Rasengan onto the sword. He was quick to notice that the sword absorbed his chakra and the Rasengan in his hand disappeared without a trace. Naruto then jumped back when a fireball had made its way towards him. To his side, he saw Itachi throw him several weapons that the blonde effectively blocked with his chakra shroud. Kisame wasted no time with Itachi's timely distraction and charged at the blonde whose senses picked up quite clearly that Kisame was going to attack him. The enraged Naruto leaned down and charged on all fours as Kisame brought down his sword with a mighty swing with the ground beneath it shattering on impact. It was at this time that Naruto had appeared behind him and swung his claws on the blue-skinned man's back. Unfortunately, Kisame had dodged in time and countered with Samahata by slamming the hilt of the sword onto the chakra shroud. It may have not hurt him, but the force was enough to send the blonde away from Kisame as he skidded on the ground and forming a wide trench before him. Oh this boy may be young but he is good for his age. Kisame remarked. Kisame, finish this now before Konoha catches wine that he is missing. Itachi remarked as he vanished once more into the trees. Kisame clicked his tongue in disappointment. Very well, I guess my need for some entertainment is satiated. With that, Kisame gathered water around Samahata and charged at Naruto at his best speed. He swung his blade forward letting a crescent of highly pressurized water sail through the air as Naruto tried to block it. The blonde held his ground, but the force was much too strong in the attack that he was skidding further and further back until the jutsu cancelled itself out. The blonde gave a roar of defiance and a shockwave shook the entire forest but Kisame was undeterred. The former swordsman of the mist swung his blade horizontally letting it pass just above the boy who dodged the blade by ducking. The rush of power left him and Naruto looked on in surprise as his sapphire orbs returned from its crimson color before he felt something painful shoved him in his chest as Kisame slammed his sword on his stomach. Thank you for the meal. Kisame mentioned with a smile as he flew slightly upwards and Kisame turned in opposite direction this time as he positioned the blonde in midair and once more slammed the Samahata on the boy's stomach from above this time and taking Naruto with it as the blades of the sword embedded itself in Naruto's flesh and his world exploded into pain when he was slammed on the ground. The earth cratered from Kisame's monstrous strength as dust and debris scattered all around. Naruto coughed out blood from his mouth as he was held down on the ground his clothes in complete tatters and his blood spilling on the forest floor beneath him. H. How? Naruto asked. Kisame entertained the boy's question one final time. The Jinchuriki was supposed to die anyway. Samahata has the power to absorb chakra into its own. Any form of chakra satisfies it and its favorite happens to be chakra of a tailed beast. T. The village. Naruto muttered as Kisame decided to lengthen the blades of Samahata longer and dig deeper into Naruto's body with some in his chest. Naruto gave a silent scream. Itachi-san has been part of Konoha's elite Anbu unit. Walking into Konoha is like walking into his own backyard. It was indeed an easy thing to do and even if the village knew about us, it doesn't mean Itachi-san would be forever left in the dust of Konoha's landscape. The shinobi swordsman answered his question and Naruto was losing consciousness fast. N need to. Get away. Naruto mumbled incoherently. The loss of blood was distorting his vision and his thoughts. He could feel and hear his heart beating fast. Kisame and Itachi looked at him as the swordsman smirked, pulling yourself out of Samahata would do more harm than good, and you'll die faster. Not, gonna, die, Naruto mumbled his breathing was becoming labored as he tried to push himself off the blades trying as hard as he could but Samahata's blades just ended up cutting him up further and further. Put him down, now. They heard an angry scream as Itachi saw a large fireball screaming at his way as the two dodged. It was then that Naruto managed to pull himself out of the blades as he fell on the ground. The Akatsuki are here. Chase after them and send help here quickly. We've got an injured ninja. Another voice shouted. Kisame, let us retreat. 
It would seem the full force of Konoha is on to us. Itachi advised and Kisame sighed. This was another failure. Well, at least it would be easier to locate the tailed beast once it happened. What about the boy? Kisame asked with a frown. Failing a mission twice didn't seem to go well with him. Leave him. He will undoubtedly die, anyway. You have severely punctured his organs and several major arteries in the process and lacerated himself in getting away from us furthering the damage. We will have a better chance once the Kayubi reforms itself. Itachi mentioned as he and Kisame soon ran away. Come back here, Itachi. Sasuke shouted in all the fury he could ever muster he was held back by Kakashi who held him on his shoulder. Sasuke. You are no match for him. Stay back. Kakashi sensei. I don't care. Look at what he did to Naruto. Sasuke shouted in rage as he pointed to the blonde who was bleeding profusely. Oh my god. Sakura had arrived. Tears were welling from her eyes as she looked at the blonde when she got close. He was breathing slowly and blood was splattered everywhere around him. Sakura. Even still, I will not let a subordinate risk his life so carelessly. One person about to lose his life is enough. Don't you dare say those words. Sasuke shouted as he was forced down by the Anbu member with a pair of clones. Another voice shouted from the distance as Naruto heard that familiar voice. It soothed him to say the least, in this cold and unforgiving environment. Naruto-kun. Hanada. She's here. Don't worry Naruto. We'll get you back in the village as soon as possible. Sakura assured her teammate whose voice was shaking as she tried to stop the bleeding. The blades had managed to hit several major arteries. She noticed, although she wasn't a medic, she could still tell if a person was losing a lot of blood. For now, she needed to stop the bleeding to help her teammate. No, Sakura, it's okay. Naruto stopped her. Sakura stopped for a second and then protested. Idiot. Don't say those words. Tears were now falling from her eyes. Her hands were shaking in fear. By now, Sasuke, Kakashi and Hinata were beside him. He could tell, he could still see them. Kakashi remained silent as his eyes were closed. No, really, Naruto assured her. He voice felt tired and shaking. He wanted to sleep. Sasuke, was that guy, with the Sharingan your brother? Naruto asked. Sasuke was shaking in fury and in pure mental agony in seeing Naruto so messed up. He had thought his tears were all shed back then, but now, they came back in full vengeance. He was biting his lower lip, he couldn't answer with words and he could only nod. He, was after me, Naruto said to his teammate and friend. Why? Sasuke could only ask. He was after the biju sealed within me, Naruto answered as he looked up. Naruto, what are you talking about? It was Kakashi who had finally answered them. Twelve years ago, the day of the attack of the Kayubi, the Yandaimi Hokage had defeated the beast. But in truth, he could not kill the Kayubi, so instead, he sealed it in an infant. Naruto was the one chosen. Recalling that night, Kakashi remembered the faces of his fallen friends, today would be another shame he would add on the list of his many failures. I never asked, for any of this, Naruto answered. Tears were now falling from his face. I just wanted, to be needed. He let out. It was when Hinata cried and went for Naruto's hand. Please, Naruto-kun, don't do this. I have always needed you. You have always been important to me, more than just friends. Please, keep fighting, I can't lose you too. Hearing those words, Naruto couldn't help but grab onto Hinata's hand, although weakened. He decided to pull her closer with all of his remaining strength. Hanada was now on his chest as he embraced her with right hand. Thank you, Hanada. whenever I was with you, I feel that I could just let go and be myself, thank you, for saying those words. No, Naruto, please, no. Don't leave me, please. Keep fighting, don't say those words. If you go, I don't know what I would do without you. I would do anything to keep you here with me, anything. Hanada replied now her pretty face was marred with Naruto's blood staining it along with her own tears. I'm sorry, I'm just so tired, Naruto said as he looked back at Sasuke. Sasuke. Naruto smiled a little, crying doesn't suit you, Tem. Sasuke replied with his eyes closed tears were still falling, shut up, you fucking idiot. Give them hell. Sasuke couldn't take it anymore, his rage and sorrow were at their tipping point. He turned his back on Naruto and performed the Shunshin no Jutsu. Sasuke, come back here. 
Kakashi was surprised when Sasuke's shunshin had improved greatly over the bout of a few weeks. This was totally unexpected for him. Kakashi had to catch up, or else he would lose another student. Ah, so tired. Don't fall asleep, you idiot. We're right here. Don't close your eyes, you hear me. Please don't joke around about this. Sakura replied. But Naruto didn't listen, his eyelids were heavy, he wanted to sleep. I'm, so, sorry. He replied, his eyes were closing, he was going to sleep and he wanted to sleep for a very long period. It was then that a three pairs of masked ninja came down from the treetops and pulled Naruto out of Hinata's grasp. We'll take it from here, we're sorry for your loss. They placed the boy into a black body bag and the two Anbu members performed a hand sign. The body bag had a seal lit up before they disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Sakura went for Hinata as she was still there sitting down on the forest floor, as the rain began to fall. Tears continued to fall down from her face as the blood of her only beloved started to fall onto the ground. But her sadness was never present, only an expression of total blankness. Sakura tried to get her up, but found that Hinata was too rigid to move. I, couldn't save him, Hinata mumbled, Sakura could only give her friend a hug. Inside Naruto, something stirred, the giant fox inside of him could only watch as the darkness slowly began encroaching. The beast stared down at the chakra figure, stirring outside the cage before dispersing outwards. The creeping shadow stood in suspension, the chakra that lived inside Naruto would not let it. Kurama could only watch as he sent more chakra outwards to try and heal the boy now that this person was preventing the death of his container. If that is to be done, then no words need to be spoken from me. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.